get started. So if that's going to take you to take your seat, so we can go ahead and get started. And you shouldn't be afraid about sitting down in front here. I don't think Randall's going to bite. I know I don't. So if you want to get a little closer. Um, Chris does. No. Chris. That's true. <laughs> Um, I see a lot of familiar faces here, uh, but for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm Dan Bucks. I'm uh, the assistant town manager for Town of Bennington and the planning director for the Town of Bennington, and I also have my uh, assistant uh, or uh, assistant chairperson for the Bennington County Regional Commission hat on tonight. So, um, first I want to just welcome everyone. Thank you for coming out tonight. Um, I think we're going to have a great presentation. Uh, I want to welcome our speaker, speaker Randall Aaron, and Jim Sullivan's going to give him a proper introduction afterwards, but uh, just want to welcome him and thank him for coming. Um, I want to thank Bennington College for providing this venue. I want to thank Jim Sullivan for putting this all together. Thanks, Jim, <coughs> our executive director of the Regional Commission. And uh, we have several sponsors that I want to thank uh, this evening. Um, <coughs> MSK Engineering and Design, uh, Bennington College, the town of Bennington. Uh, the law firm of Wilmington, Campbell, Bent, and Stasny, and the Southern Vermont Economic, e Economy Project, excuse me. All of those folks have contributed to help make this happen tonight, so thanks so much to them. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and have Jim Sullivan, our executive director, introduce our speaker tonight. So thank you very much for coming. And yeah, thank you, Dan. And uh, just a, a, you know, a, a brief, a brief, um, brief overview of the agenda. So we're going to have a presentation for um, an hour or so from, from Randall, and then we'll break, you probably saw that there's some food out there in the lobby. So we'll break, um, get some food, we'll try to keep that um, to like 15 minutes to get the food and retrieve it. You can bring it back in here so that um, you know, we, don't, we don't prolong uh, the, the evening too long. Um, and, then, uh, and then we'll have the second part of the presentation, hopefully some time for questions and answers at the end. Um, you know, I, I just want to say, you know, in, in, in my experience, this is uh, really an important topic to talk about right now. Build, you know, building and site design is, is so strongly influences how our communities work, and how people feel about them, both residents and visitors. And uh, you know, a lot of our a lot of our land use regulations around here, and probably in a lot of places, date back uh, 50 plus years. I, I think I could go back to the old technical planning associates uh, um, uh, zoning template that was used, and, and still find a lot of those pieces in a lot of our ordinances. And uh, a lot of good things in there, but a lot of that really focused on segregating uses and had some fairly um, rudimentary ideas about um, locating buildings on lots and restricting the size and, and placement of buildings. And uh, probably in a, in a way that if we, um, when we think about it now, if we followed those codes really strictly, it does not result in the, uh, the form of, of community that we we enjoy and that we talk about in our in our uh, vision statements and our town plans. Um, so we've we've certainly made some progress in the area. We many of our municipalities have adopted design review districts and hi historic districts. So we've we've uh, done a lot recently with uh, trying to find ways to promote compact mixed use development and work with complete street ideas to try to make our communities more human-oriented and walkable. But we can certainly do a lot more and a lot better by really leading uh, with some clear and consistent approaches um, to, uh, to the design of our built environment. And so fortunately, we're, we are very fortunate to have Randall Aaron here tonight, and Randall has been a leader, a leading proponent, proponent of effectively integrating design into land use planning in a way that supports the creation of vibrant and attractive communities. He's spoken on the subject to national and international professional planning, building, and environmental organizations, has published numerous books and articles, including, ah, we have visual, visual here, <laughs> Rural by Design, <laughs> um, Planning for Town and Country, excuse me, which is, a, oh, there's one here too. Uh, which is really a, a, a tremendous resource for any planning professional or any um, uh, local planning commission or commissioner. 
And uh, the really great thing about, about Randall and the work that he's done is that he recognizes and appreciates the importance of, of design and planning for the, just the types of, of small towns and communities that we have in our region. Um, the importance of those things as well as is the, uh, you know, the, the limitations that, that we have as, as small communities. Um, but finding ways to put together really effective ordinances um, that will will drive the kind of development that we've been talking about. So um, there's a, I could talk an awful lot about Randall's accomplishments and over the years, but uh, I will uh, I will not waste any of his time, <laughs> and I'll just turn it over to Randall Aaron. Thank you so much, Randall. Thank you. Now is this on? Can you hear me yep. through the great? Um, I really appreciate your being here. This is the first time I've shown this particular slideshow, put it together, uh, particularly for this audience. And I really didn't know where the, uh, what level I needed to speak to because we have professionals, we've got lay people, we've got lay people with decades of experience on local boards and commissions, we've got lay people with, uh, uh, who are relatively new to those jobs. Uh, we might even have a few students uh, in the room. So there's a wide variety of, of uh, you all in the audience, but what you share is an interest in learning how to enable your communities to grow better. Uh, basically, I'll be talking about a couple of approaches to regulating form, not land use necessarily or density, but the form. And I'll be talking about form-based codes on the one hand, and then shifting over fairly quickly to form-based design standards or form-based design review, which is just as effective and about you know 10 times simpler and shorter, uh, and it really cuts to the chase and gets things done. But we're talking about rural highways. This is Group 9 in Kennebunk, Maine, uh, going down toward Kennebunk Port. And this is uh, downtown Kent, Connecticut, where you see a Build 2 line or a uh, a maximum front setback, not a minimum front setback, maximum front setback in both of these. Uh, sometimes they're called a build two line. But the exception to the rule is the alcove. With, if we required the developer to put all his buildings right at the edge of the sidewalk, we'd have no alcove, no sitting area, no little you know, park or plaza. So I think it's important to allow some intelligent exceptions to uh, otherwise good rules. And then there's a build-up line or a, a minimum height. So instead of saying maximum height and minimum setback, we say maximum front setback, like zero, or 20 feet with no parking in front, and minimum building height. Now, you might want to have a maximum building height so someone doesn't do something taller than what your fire uh, department can, can, can reach. Uh, but those two concepts of closest to the street and height above ground are, are really key to both form-based coding and form-based uh, design standards. Um, back when I was at the Center for Rural Massachusetts at UMass uh, 25 to 30 years ago, we did a book called Dealing with Change in the Connecticut River Valley, which was a design manual for conservation and development. And that led to a number of other, um, you'll see some illustrations from that as we go along. And the successor to that really was the first edition of Rural by Design, which came out in 1994. Uh, and that was really a compendium, a kind of encyclopedia of planning uh, topics. Uh, and I followed it up with Crossroad Hamlet Village Town, uh, which was an attempt to show how the new urbanism can be related to small town planning uh, and some conservation issues. Uh, and my penultimate book was Envisioning Better Communities, uh, Seeing More Options, Making Wiser Choices, extremely visual. Um, and then APA, American Planning Association, said, about time you updated Rural by Design. So essentially I set aside 80% of the original edition and plugged in a new 80%. So it's almost an entirely new book. Um, and it's got a slightly different title because the subtitle is Planning for Town and Country. Um, now form-based regulations uh, you know, come in two forms that I just mentioned. Uh, one is the, the form-based codes 
and they're sort of been the hot topic in planning circles for five or ten years. Uh, and then there are form-based design standards, which is a new look at an older technique, uh, which is design standards that, that towns have had in historic districts and, and downtown areas for many, many years, but they haven't necessarily been as sharp and as complete as they could be, which is why I thank the new urbanists for introducing form-based codes, which pointed out a few things that we could have and should have been doing with form-based design standards, with our design standards. So if you marry the old design standards we've had since, the, say, the 80s and 90s with the form-based coding of the last 10 years and simplify it and boil it down to its essentials, you, what you come up with, I believe, is form-based design standards. And they can find a home in your zoning ordinance, in a site plan review ordinance or in a design review ordinance. Uh, now the coding, which is has sort of been the hot topic uh, with a lot of uh, planners uh, in recent years, you know, regulates development according to the building type or its form, its size, and its placement on the lot. And it really doesn't pay much attention at all. In fact, uh, strong advocates of form-based coding says don't be concerned about land use at all. Don't be concerned about density at all. And I say, well, come to New England and speak with some planning board members and, and see how that flies and speak with the public. Uh, I, I do believe we need to meld ideas together to get the best uh, result. Um, so density and land uses are controlled indirectly by building types, so they say. I, I, I'm not a convert to that. Uh, and they're usually administered by a staff, not by a planning board. Uh, and I say, well, where is the public input? Someone wants to build a new Cumberland Farms, or a new apartment building, a new office block. Uh, oh, well, the public input occurred seven years ago when we did the form-based code. Now, seven years later, someone's coming in and using this code, and it's going to be administered by staff, and there are no public meetings and no public comments. And that's the, the, the uh, response I get from the, the, the people that have invented this form-based coding, which is why I think that the best part of form-based coding is the form-based and not the code. I've seen these codes, a short, the, the typically short ones run to 100 pages. They've been known to go to 100, 150, 200, 250 pages. And that's just about building form. So. I think there's a simpler way to address this, um, and that's taking the ideas of the, the, the form uh, and, and plugging that into the design standards that we've had for decades. So form-based coding, I think, is great for really larger communities, uh, Denver, Miami, mm -hmm. Chicago, Atlanta, uh, Cincinnati, uh, or some you know the secondary cities of, of considerable size, 100,000. Uh, Lowell, Massachusetts, be a good candidate for form-based coding. I used to work in downtown Lowell in their historic district. Uh, but you get to the small towns in New England, and uh, the best example I've seen, we'll be speaking about it in a, in a moment, is from uh, Dover, New Hampshire, and they boiled it down to 20 pages. But that's the, the shortest one I've ever seen. So if you, if you really want to look at a form-based code, per se, uh, I would steer you to Dover, New Hampshire. But, um, you know, there are a lot of other, you know, there are many ways to skin the cat, many ways to achieve the goal. <coughs> the parameters that you see here are about the same parameters that you can plug into form-based design review or form-based uh, design standards. And they're the, you know, the, the important things that we, we sometimes you know, have overlooked in our zoning in the past, like, the maximum front setback or the minimum building height, which I talked about earlier. Having the primary entrance onto the street and not onto a side parking lot. Mm -hmm. Have minimum uh, window requirements facing the street so we don't have blank walls or nearly blank walls or just faux windows facing the street. Um, minimum street frontage uh, uh, plugged up with buildings so you don't have in a downtown gaps where Developers put build, uh, parking to the side rather than to the rear. Because if you put parking to the side, that makes more of a gap 
between buildings and it lessens the, uh, the uh, continuity of the townscape. Uh, maximum block length so that uh, blocks are walkable. Uh, if you don't have intersections every 500 feet, for example, blocks can be too long. But in those cases, you can do pedestrian cut-throughs at mid-block. So you could have a block that's 800 feet long for cars, but 400 feet long for pedestrians through those mid-block connections. Uh, they're sometimes called tweetons um, in, in England. And I was recently in, where was it, uh, Stade in, in Germany, Stade. And I saw Tavita uh, Langa, and uh, that, that was basically uh, the German for um, the mid-block connection, which was more than an alley, but less than a street. So block length is important to consider. A mixture of uses within the building or within the, the blocks is very important, and we haven't addressed that sufficiently with our current zoning in most communities. Uh, the same thing for, for street planning within parking lots or along the, the streets, and a, a greater variety of residential types, not only in, in um, downtowns, but uh, in, in established neighborhoods. And, and finally, uh, maximum lot size and widths and sewer areas to achieve the minimum densities. Um, my, my planning training was actually in Edinburgh, and after getting my degree, I migrated south where the jobs were to Norfolk uh, in, in East Anglia. And there I discovered that they don't deal with maximum densities like we would here. They have minimum densities. Don't dare build lot fewer than 12, 14, 16 dwellings to the acre. If you come in with a development that is less dense than that, forget it. So if you visited Britain or the continent and wonder why it feels so different, it's because they've found a way to uh, live with those higher density land uses and mix those uses very, very well. So I think we, I, I'm not advocating densities like, like that uh, in, in every town in Bendington County, but I bet you could easily get, uh, you know, 10 units the acre uh, or 12 units the acre in Bendington's downtown. Probably what you're doing in the, in the Putnam block uh, is meeting or exceeding that kind of standard. Um, Dover, New Hampshire, um, is a good model. It did cost them about $100,000, which is a lot of money. But in the world of form-based coding, that was bargain basement. Um, it, since they adopted it, they've um, built a half a dozen mixed-use buildings. Uh, the city is uh, a bit larger than Bennington, and that was their first building, a corner building, and done very nicely. It's sort of like the building at your four corners, the Philly's building. Uh, you know, right in your downtown. Uh, the design review uh, process can have this, basically the same standards as form-based coding, uh, with the maximum front setbacks, the minimum building height, rear parking, and it produced nearly the same results. Uh, and it can be paired with zoning to allow a broader <coughs> mixture of land use, land uses, and and, and densities. Uh, so. If we like the idea of regulating form, I think it's important that we also look at the potential for mixing uses more and increasing density. Density should never be um, you know, a negative word. It should be just an, ob an objective uh, description of how many units or how much floor space uh, is you know created on an acre in a number of floors above grade, uh, and unlike most form-based codes, form-based design standards are administered by boards and are subject to a lot of public review and comment. These are the same parameters you just saw uh, for form-based coding. So I'm not quite sure why a whole lot of planners invented form-based coding. When we had the tools here in New England 30 years ago, we just needed to hone them and brush them up and, and uh, augment them and refine them. 
which is where I think that communities will find the best uh, results, the uh, most cost-effective results. Um, so within the zoning framework, uh, rather than FBZs, FBCs, I'm going to show you uh, for the next 45 minutes in, in this part one, um, what it looks like to have form-based design standards. Uh, Freeport, Maine is just um, a few minutes from where I live in Brunswick, and they've had form-based uh, design standards, very simple, ones that I think in the local planning things could still be augmented, refined, and, and improved. But the results that they've gotten with like a five or six page ordinance uh, are these uh, in downtown Freeport. And I don't think the results are too shabby. Um, and it didn't cost them anywhere near $97,000, which is what Dover paid, and they felt they got a bargain. Um, when have you seen an Arby's look as good as that? Um, this is uh, you know, the only example in here of an LL Bean building. People can say, well, Freeport, it's LL Bean, they got gazillions of dollars. Well, that's what they did, and among other buildings in Freeport, but none of the others uh, are Bean buildings. Now, that is a bit dated. Um, I'd say that was probably done about 20, 25 years ago, looking at it. Uh, I think all buildings uh, look dated. Um, and that can be a, um, a very good thing. We go downtown, we see you know, the original Putnam Block buildings dating from the 1870s, 1880s. This is a, an example from the new uh, edition of Rural by Design, where School Street was extended. Uh, and that runs up, if you go to the end of School Street, you basically get to the center of Freeport. Uh, and it ended there, because no one built a bridge across this street. Uh, and then when Packers wanted to build a new supermarket, but a very specialized one, uh, they approached uh, Freeport Planning Board and they said, well, we want you to uh, have your building touch the street at least one point. Uh, and they did, uh, down in here. Uh, the original uh, buildings were over there. This is the new uh, footprint that they put in. Um, and they extended the, uh, the street. This is a lower level because this is a high point. It goes downhill to this point. So all of this is about eight feet below the street level. But you see what it looks like, the parking that is down like eight feet above the, below the street level. These, the, the end of the supermarket is some affordable housing which fronts right onto uh, the street leading into the, into the uh, town from, from Brunswick. And they built it to look like a sort of a 19th century uh, industrial building with a monitor here and, and very large uh, sliding doors which are you know, reminiscent of some barn doors. Um, they've done all this with design review. They, because there was some, some natural areas in the property, they said, well, let's put in a picnic area and a park, uh, natural area trails, do your stormwater polishing down in there. So there's more to this than just the grocery store and the uh, affordable housing and the street extension. Um, and this, these are the affordable units which are right on that street, which leads you know five miles uh, away to, to the center of Brunswick. Davidson, North Carolina, um, you know, approximately the same size as Bennington, small college town uh, near Charlotte. Uh, this is one of the first buildings they built. They had a, a, a minimum height of two stories in their downtown. There were a lot of people at Paul, uh, but if you wanted to get an approval, you built a second story. And that was the very first one. The college built it, but there are a number of other ones. Uh, for instance, this one here was a, a gasoline station uh, until about 10 years ago. Here's another gasoline station, which has been uh, uh, replaced with a three-story building, sort of like a uh, flat iron building, because it's very, it comes to a point there. Uh, this is a CVS, and CVS said, no, we, we never do two-story buildings. And Davidson said, well, thank you very much. Uh, we'll move on to the next applicant. <laughs> and they were dumbfounded. Uh, all the little CVS built a two-story building, and they put the offices on the second floor. No baby. Uh, and that's what it looks like. It's a nice corner location. So opposite the Put Putnam Block, my dream for downtown Bennington, if this is where the Putnam Block corner is, uh, 
and that's North Street and this is South Street, that would be, you know, a great corner to build up uh, to complement the wonderful things that are happening with the Putnam Block. So that's your rear parking uh, there. Kent, Connecticut, that's the building you saw on the very first slide, and you see, see how it uh, emic, uh, you know, mimics the, the uh, gable ends uh, of other buildings and, and keeps with the street line the, the, the small setback. And that's a little courtyard in front, but it leads through a passageway to a courtyard uh, in, inside. So the front courtyard is there, and the interior courtyard is right here. And this is their main street, and their parking is around the side and the back. Uh, that's the interior courtyard looking out to the street. And again, looking out to the street from that inner courtyard. Visioning is very important before we start you know, mucking about with codes and, 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 and planning documents. Uh, in Warwick, New York, which is just north of the New Jersey state line, a uh, lovely little town with a Victorian center, the town of Warwick, <coughs> uh, which surrounds the, the incorporated uh, village of Warwick wanted to revisit this gateway uh, into the uh, into, into, into the village through the town, and it is you know kind of typical gateway, and it's not very uh, uh, not not something that many communities would be really proud of. So, as a result of a visioning process. An artist was engaged to translate the comments uh, and do a three-dimensional um, idea, you know, conceptual sketch of what those uh, comments and, and uh, you know, conference takeaways were. And that really informed the design standards that they came up with, uh, which I can you know, email to people if anyone wants. I mean, you know, I've got business cards here. I can email you a lot of material. This was the first building that came through that process uh, after the visioning and after the design uh, regulations were, were uh, adopted. As we drive around rural highways, we see you know build, uh, signs like this uh, frequently. It's zoned for commercial, but what will it look like? How far from the street will it be? How tall will it be? What is the, the uh, architecture going to look like? What's the landscaping? How are they going to handle the stormwater? Where is the parking going to be? Typical zoning ordinances are very, very weak on that, which is why we need those design standards. In our Connecticut Valley Design Manual, uh, we began with a, uh, an aerial photograph of a real uh, intersection. This would probably have been in Hadley, Massachusetts, between Amherst and Northampton. And then we would show fast forward 20 years with the uh, zoning that Hadley had and said, OK, Hadley, uh, this is what you're zoning. Is that what you want? Oh, we want you know, gradables. We want floor space that will be taxable, that will help our, you know, uh, town budget. Okay, well, what about getting, gathering the floor space together and, uh, you know, making it in more of a hamlet or village? And uh, these graphics led to a number of towns putting <coughs> their own, you know, design standards to make sure that we would build more compactly and not allow commercial development to sprawl. This is the gateway, not to Warwick, New York, but to uh, another uh, town uh, about 20 miles north of that. And I forget the name. It's been many years since I've been there. Stone something. It's just south of Woodstock, New York. So this is the first thing you uh, see when you enter this village uh, near Woodstock. And the parking is to the rear. Uh, and even on a rural highway, people don't need to see parking up front. In fact, the building could have been moved closer to the road. I'm not sure why it wasn't. But in a rural location, I don't find that to be objectionable, to have uh, a deeper setback, as long as it's not cluttered with cars. The nod to the Hudson Valley uh, School of Architecture that the Dutch brought over, uh, so to speak, uh, is seen in, in the way that the, the, the uh, the roof terminates uh, with these uh, little porches, the massive chimneys. And the parking is you know, respectfully uh, located at the rear, which is where the, the entrances are. But there would be shop windows and signs facing the street 
as well as shop windows and signs facing the parking lot to give you know, double exposure. Now downtown location, this is one of the uh, first buildings built uh, in the motor age in Falmouth, Massachusetts on Cape Cod. Falmouth is an old town going back to the 1700s. Uh, and in the 1920s, this intersection became, uh, became developed into something called the Queen's Byway. And like a lot of buildings built in the 20s, they were just single stories. So there is a, a problem here. But this was really on the outskirts of downtown as it was merging into the countryside. <coughs> um, but it did keep the street line and all the parking is behind. And the, uh, there are entrances both front and back to all these shops. And it's been very successful for about 100 years now, almost 100 years. This is the first example I've, I've seen where the, uh, uh, the building form uh, kept the street line even after the advent of the automobile era uh, in, a, in a location which was not you know, in the heart of downtown. This is a design that, uh, a little sketch of Harry Dodson, a landscape architect friend of mine, a, a collaborator in the past, showed how not to create, uh, this would be like the uh, Asian restaurant um, in downtown Bennington that I think may have been a Dunkin' Donuts originally. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh, it looks yeah. like it was a Dunkin' Donuts. Yeah. Yeah. And buildings like that should have a design life of 25 years, which means we should replace it, bring it forward, and give it another story. So <coughs> every town has got its examples of opportunities for redevelopment. Uh, where I live in Brunswick, I could name a half a dozen as well. Uh, this is up in Casanova. And this, I, understand, I fully understand why they built that 30 years ago. But why did they spend money five years ago putting parsley around the pig instead of bringing the pig forward and making it into a, a creature that was worthy of this Main Street location? <laughs> and giving it at least a faux second story, of which I am not fond. I would much rather have a functional second story. I'll show you a faux second story in Camden, Maine, in a few minutes, which sort of drives me crazy, but at least it's better than a single story building. So I, if there's a way for towns to stop people from reinvesting in mistakes that were done decades ago, and we're not going to blame anybody for doing it originally, but if we don't learn from the past mistakes, we simply you know, reinforce them. That'll be there for another 30 years because the investment that went into that. <coughs> and in Williamstown, um, I believe that this was probably inspired by you know, uh, turrets and steeples in, in the town that, that were you know, up and down that, that main street. Very tall uh, lintels, um, transom windows, very low sills. Those are the hallmarks of traditional 19th century storefront architecture. Very low sills, very tall uh, lintels and, and transoms. Oxford, Ohio. A lot of off-campus off student housing from the University of Miami in Oxford, Ohio. Problems in the neighborhoods. Uh, in Brunswick, same thing. So I'm bringing these ideas into Brunswick, uh, Maine, and every college town, I think, could maybe benefit from this example. Rather than leave the one-story building there and reinvesting it, that one-story building was replaced by multi-story, putting three levels of student housing, private student housing, almost luxury student housing, uh, in the downtown, which is where the students prefer to live, rather than out in satellite housing uh, developments or in established neighborhoods where the neighbors don't want them. So we can see, you know, this building here is that building there. So this is the new building that was put in and made to look like two tall buildings, two tall narrow buildings. Um, in a small town context, that second story can take the, the, the form of you know, something like this, typically with uh, residential above, but it could be offices. Uh, in downtown Brunswick, uh, this is our latest new development called Brunswick Station. Um, 
and it's a combination of restaurants and uh, shops, uh, offices, residential, everything. And uh, we call Brunswick Station because Amtrak now has daily passenger service there. Uh, so more locally, we've got some you know, really good examples, I think, uh, which show that the design standards you have now are pretty well tuned up here in, in Bennington. Uh, as they are in a number of communities, does it mean that you've gone as far as you can? Probably not. I mean, we probably always improve any ordinance. This was some early down, uh, downtown infill in Oxford, Ohio. Not nearly as sophisticated as the last picture I showed you with the student housing above. But not a bad infill. But clearly, uh, they were on a learning curve. And this is as they were ascending that learning curve before they got to the point they are today. Uh, Another great example uh, here that uh, you'll recognize. Um, and how many dollar stores are there uh, in New England or across America where they you know, have, you know, they've met the street line. Uh, they've got a, it looks like the main entrance is to the parking lot, but they still have a lot of glazing facing the street, which is important. May, may I speak to that? Pardon me? May I speak to that? You may speak, please speak to that. Um, if, you stood on, if you stood in Bennington on Four Corners, when, it, when the church was built, there was a view up to the church, uh -huh. which both the motel and this dollar store have destroyed. That view. When you come into Bennington from the west, you see Old First Church. When you stand on the corner of School Street and Main Street, you see the Baptist Church Tower. When you come in to Bennington, from west, east, you see the Baptist Church. We saw St. Francis. Now you can't. If one of the lessons I learned in doing rural planning is you want to protect a view, whatever it is, a view of a building, a view of a farm, you buy it. I, uh, last night, I uh, visited a good friend of mine in Rensselaer County, and she has restored a number of barns, and she bought the property across the street from it, not for barns, not for any use, but to pre preserve the view so it wouldn't be compromised by new buildings there. She wanted to keep that rural landscape. <clears throat> I appreciate the need to have urban vistas too, but if we are to preserve urban vistas, I think we need to step up with the money to buy the land to keep it low as a park with just ground level landscaping and trees rather than, than buildings. Um, I, I'm always sad when a view disappears, but there are not many ways to preserve a view without buying land. And I, if, if people have other ways to preserve a view without buying the land or have, buying an easement to prevent development on the land, uh, I'd love to hear them because, you know, it, it's expensive to buy land, it's expensive to buy easements. Um, this is one of the first buildings built with new design standards probably 25 years ago in Bainbridge Island, which is uh, out of, uh, from Seattle, the Hubble and Hayes with uh, residential above uh, commercial. Um, a pre-design review building in Dover, New Hampshire, which is not far from the one with the curving uh, corner that you saw about 20 minutes ago. And that's a car wash downtown. Um, now I guess they needed this as a staging area out front so they couldn't bring that building right to the front because of the need for vehicular turning movements. Do you know what's on the second floor? Pardon me? Do you know what's on the second floor? I did ask, is there are offices? Okay. Yeah. Because the entire ground floor is nothing but uh, car washing machinery and drains. Uh, Jiffy Loop uh, in downtown Carver, North Carolina. There's a kind of similar use here in downtown Bennington that's set back. How could we help that? Well, what they did here was they built a brick wall along the front with a gap to get in and out. Uh, and that, that does help. Uh, so there's some architectural tricks that can be used, uh, but the Jiffy Loop building itself here was not set back. It was right, you know, the, the building itself 
was brought to the, the, the front, but the actual uh, building in front was also uh, in this development part of a, a Papa John's uh, pizza place. So it's Papa John's here, the gap with the wall, and the jiffy <coughs> was right here. And that makes you know a really nice way of, of uh, you know building up that street front to the maximum extent and still you know allowing this use to go in there. Now one might argue that we shouldn't have a car wash downtown. I don't think that's too bad. The one in um, Dover, New Hampshire, wasn't too bad. But in my preference would be not to have downtown settings. But if they have to go downtown. Uh, we need to do something uh, to soften that effect. We have gaps in, in all our towns, uh, and I don't know what's going to go here, but I am confident that between build two lines and build up lines here in Bennington, that gap will be plugged, or it will become a park uh, and dedicated as such. They, they did that in Bath, Maine recently, with a gap that just proved unpluggable after 30 years. This was a gap that was created by a fire uh, in Lewisburg, West Virginia, uh, maybe about 20 years ago, and five years later, uh, during which time a lot of talk and a lot of effort was put together, this park was created with um, you know, efforts between the city and, and foundations and individuals. Uh, so, and this is a corner, downtown corner location. Uh, and decided they needed a park like a New England town green that it never had before. So that's one response to uh, a building disappearing. If, we, if it's impossible to build it up properly again, uh, can we make lemonade out of the lemons? Uh, in Brunswick, Georgia, there are several signature parks that are the same, like little pocket parks in downtown Brunswick, Georgia, which had uh, yeah, and I'm jumping because I thought I had more slides than that. Uh, this is a little pocket park in Belfast, Rockland, Maine, same day that I photographed Belfast. So sometimes little leftover spaces in the downtowns can be put to some really, really good uses. Uh, I was admiring the, uh, the curbside plantings here in Bennington, uh, but it recalled to me that in, in Rockland, in some blocks, not all blocks, uh, the, the entire space from corner to corner uh, has been filled uh, with uh, annuals and perennials and trees and benches. So that is one of the best examples I've seen in the downtown of really providing um, a great setting for pedestrians. Now, let, Landscaping parking downtown is always a challenge. This is a response in Freeport, Maine. This is the response in uh, Camden, Maine, with the Rosa Ragosa uh, native uh, beach rose with uh, a rail fence. Well, maybe it's not rail. Rails are horizontal, aren't they? Yeah. Um, but it's not, I'm not sure what that type of fence is called. It's almost like balance. <laughs> is it, is it no, I don't think it is actually. No, it's it's it, might be. it might be by I call those Fisher Price fences. Yeah. Uh, this would be uh, landscaping along a street where there was a parking lot adjacent to the street. That would be in uh, Jackson, Wyoming. Another example of that. And that has some very severe winters. Really good for stormwater, too. But it's very good for stormwater. I mean, we, I, you're uh, leaping forward in a way because I, I cover that too. Uh, this would be an old picture from Stowe, Vermont, if I'm not mistaken. It's so old I can't be positive. But, uh, these bushes, if I went back today, would probably be almost hiding the fence. Uh, in Holland, Michigan, uh, they, it's a, very much a horticultural capital of uh, western Michigan. Uh, they do a lot of really good parking lot landscaping. These are the parking lots behind the Main Street stores. And they close their Main Street um, for an evening once a month during the summer, uh, if not more frequently. These would be the rear entrances, landscape rear entrances from the 
landscape mm -hmm. parking lots. Uh, and if you went through the building, you, this would be the, the, the front of that building. So That's a lot still of, Holland. Me? That's still Holland? It's still Holland, yeah. And they do have a lot of tulips in Holland, Michigan, <laughs> but not in their downtowns, at least when I was there. This is a planting island, which was planted with uh, fescue, but it could have been planted with trees. Now, what do you do with a downtown gasoline station? It's going to be there for a long time. This is Rhinebeck, New York. They planted trees, and that kept the street line as much as you could do. Uh, and here in uh, Bennington, where the Goodwill store is, and the trust company, uh, there is a similar line of trees, which is a way of helping to keep the street line where there is a front parking lot that you can't do anything with until redevelopment, in which case, when the Goodwill building comes down, it can be moved closer to the street. Storefront design and historic buildings, when I worked in Lowell, we had a great archive of uh, historic uh, photographs. So we could see what the build an actual building looked like. So when that building was going to be rehabilitated in 1980, having gone through a lot of obnoxious uh, screwball you know, renovations in the 40s and 50s and 60s, we knew what it looked like. We could bring it back. You see these uh, these are stall risers with windows, which show the uh, would allow light to go into the cellar. Uh, some of these windows. Uh, are hinged, and the coal could be poured into the cellar through these openings. Um, the transoms here are um, in a, a gentle arch. But these would be the same stall risers with glass, and there would be a, uh, a countertop in here on which the articles would be displayed, like the vacuum cleaner, and that would go back into the store maybe three and a half, four feet. Uh, and then you go right back down to ground to floor level, uh, but that would give the clearance for the air or the coal to enter the, the cellar window. Uh, this is an example where there are no windows there, but it's painted black, uh, so it almost looks like there are windows. Because where there is glazing, it typically looks black, unless there's a curtain behind it or something like that. Uh, you notice the plinth. And you go up and down the streets of downtown Bennington, you see many of the older buildings on limestone plinths. There'd be granite plinths in, in Portland, Maine. This is a granite <coughs> plinth, um, and it's probably uh, from Portland or Bath. I'm not sure which. Sometimes those windows are uh, protected with grills, and I've seen that here, too, uh, in downtown uh, Bennington. So when new buildings are being built uh, in a downtown setting, Details like this matter uh, for a number of reasons. It, functionally, you can admit daylight to your cellar. Functionally, you can keep the uh, water from the pavement away from any wood that uh, meets a horizontal surface. So if it meets a, a step up rather than meets the area with rain and snow and slush, you, these will last a lot longer. If there is no plinth, if the uh, wood comes right down to the sidewalk level, uh, paint comes off, and this begins to rot. And plywood should never ever, in my opinion, be used on storefronts unless it's MDO, medium density overlay. If you ever see a boat patch in there, you know that the person who did it uh, didn't realize there was a much better product for only pennies more per sheet. <laughs> so this is an example of how not to do uh, you know, a storefront, a uh, wooden storefront meeting the uh, the sidewalk area. That, that's from Lake Placid. Uh, and here's your plant painted for some reason. That's fine. Uh, and this is a new one being poured, uh, Milford, Michigan. And this is your MDO plywood. It's got like craft paper uh, cemented onto it. It's almost like a formica surface. But it's just plywood. And it doesn't cost more. Sign painters use it because it won't buckle the paint sticks to it. So every storefront where you have to need a, a, a flat surface like this, MDO should be specified in the code because not every practicing architect knows about the product. MDO um, will be great. You know, I've seen applications where it ages and fades. It's, it's painted. Yeah, it, it, nothing lasts forever, but it has a much longer Better. design life than, than the standard exterior grade plywood. Um, this 
um, is another good example of the transoms light above the uh, display windows and light below the display windows. And these are faux, these are just MDO panels, but they, and, and these, that's real glass, but I think that it's uh, a drop ceiling. And when you have a drop ceiling, you don't really want to look at the wires. So what I suggest is that those windows be painted black from the inside, so they look just like you know any window uh, which reflects black from the outside. So these, these are faux transom windows, and they would actually be more believable if they were black plexiglass or if they were just regular glass painted black uh, from the inside. Uh, from St. John's, New Brunswick. Uh, from Lowell, Massachusetts, a brand new storefront. Original cast iron uh, pilasters and uh, lintels, but everything, all the wood and, and glazing is new. And again, from downtown Lowell, all of this in here is new. I was very lucky to work with trained historical architects in the National Park Service when I was there. Uh, this is a person that uh, has just uh, covered over his transom, which I don't think should be permitted. Uh, in you know, it going forward, we th and if that exists in a community today, there may be a voluntary program where the town, the city may offer, as Lowell did, a uh, uh, a grant or a low in or a zero interest loan to take away, re uh, remove some of the uh, mistakes of the past. Because this is a mistake. What's underneath it probably is uh, something looking very much like that. And same thing for this. Um, Tramps is being replaced. Uh, these, I think, are all new in original openings from a building probably from the mid-20s or early 30s. Brand new storefront from Lowell. Burger King, no less. Uh, Coca-Cola will pay for these signs if they uh, are allowed 10% of the signage for their logo. Uh, so we were able to work with small shop owners to get free signs. And they wanted a free sign, but Coke wanted to put up a big plastic sign, internally illuminated, white, you know, with black lettering. And we said, no, go to Coke, and as long as they get their 10% logo area, they're good. Come in and do an MDO sign, and we'll give you a choice of dark colors and, and light colors for the background and the lettering, respectively. Uh, so the building owner gets to choose his colors, but he has to choose a darker background and a lighter color. And we gave him a, a, a wide selection of uh, lettering styles that were sympathetic to the age of the building. Um, this is a sign which is mounted inside, so if w the windows are broken, and vandalism was still a problem in Lowell when I worked there, you wouldn't lose the expensive sign as well as the expensive glass. So this is a way of, and also if you moved your variety store from here to further down the block, you could just take the sign with you. Um, wonderful uh, old transom. And this is, in Brunswick, Maine, the way that they uh, recreated a transom without glass because they had a drop ceiling. So they put in these uh, tiles. And I think that works. It's not reflective, it doesn't look like glass, but it, it's, it, I, I, it works a lot better than a lot of other treatments, but I would have preferred glass, of course. Um, before and after, Dover, New Hampshire, same building, uh, new storefront, but up here it's basically taking away the plywood and giving a new paint scheme. The importance of old photographs, this is a Napa store in downtown Cunningham, Maine. That's the old photograph, not reproduced completely faithfully, but that's fine. Because what they did, I think, was terrific. I think they got 90% of the original without going to the you know, the added expense of trying to get everything absolutely perfect in terms of what it used to be. So I, I give that you know, a solid A. Uh, this was, um, oh, that, that shouldn't be there. That, that is an inset that should be there. Anyway, what was over here was just the same thing as village strip shop here. The same kind of window treatment was there. All the tall windows had been taken out and small windows put in. 
and there was no budget, either from the town or from the uh, shop owner or the building owner, to create you know, to create larger, uh, tall windows. So that is the same building, and these are totally faux. So that's what you can do with black reflective plastic on top of plywood. Mm -hmm. And it looks, it does look real. And it, it costs under $1,000. Now in downtown Lowell, we, would have, we had grants and we had higher standards. Uh, this <coughs> didn't really have uh, uh, generally, generally enforceable standards. Village locations. Uh, Wakefield, Vermont, this is uh, the front parking got moved decades ago when Route 100 was widened and they took out the front parking. Uh, I could go on and on about why you don't need a breakdown lane in the middle of a village, you need front parking. Uh, but they relocated the parking to the back and it works. Uh, and this is what it looks like today because that is an archival photograph from 25 years ago. Excuse and me. as is this. That raises a stand that goes to the heart of a fight that towns have with state highway departments. Yeah. That becomes the state highway. And the state regs have done things like remove porches and trees. And trees and saying, you know, and then then they spend money on traffic calming and stuff that actually wears away on the sidewalk. It's it's mm -hmm. kind of silly. Well the state will tell you that that's a federal standard, you get federal money, you got to but we need at some level to get to the root of that. Downtowns are for parking. You don't, if, if you have a breakdown downtown, you just put your car to the next you know, area. But downtowns need parking. They don't need a breakdown lane. This is a rural uh, highway section in the middle of the village. So have you seen any cracks that, or arguments that held sway to fight back with your... No, the local ordinances don't have any standing in the face of a state or federal rule. You need to change the state mindset and get exceptions to the federal rule for downtown settings. Now, I, I believe that local regulations are um, totally subservient legally to the uh, state and federal regulations, unfortunately. So did you, are you saying that in that particular case that it's a federal policy yeah. that those breakdown lanes be there and the yeah. states have no control over that anymore? Than the that's, what, that's what it was supposed to be by the people of Wakefield. And they were hopping ahead about it. And they complained to the DOT, uh, and the DOT said, "Our hands are tied. You got you wanted federal money. We used federal money. Sorry, no front parking." But they solved it. They they put the parking behind, and it, it works. Um, if, if, I might, trees, if I might offer uh, an encouraging note, I believe it's Danville, Vermont, uh, with Route Two running through the village, uh, spent an extensive amount of time. Uh, but worked closely with VTrans, uh, a landscape architect, um, and uh, they did a, a master planning uh, for Route 2 through the village of Danville, uh, which incorporated many of the things that we're talking about as good things. Uh, and um, so it's, at least in Vermont, uh, I, I think that we've turned one little corner uh, to give us some inroads into those kinds of issues. That's great. Thanks for uh, reporting that. My information from Wakefield was, you know, at the time I was there, 20 years ago, I doubt the federal policy, the state policy, right. yeah. but if, if the town works with the DOT uh, on a you know, visioning and a, a village center kind of planning project, I think you'd have a lot more traction. And plus, you've also got the president now. Yes. You're not the first one to crack that nut. Yes. Oh, they even buried all of their overhead utilities. Wow. Uh, now that's, um, uh, that might be a bridge too far in many places. But, uh, now Brandon's doing that now. Yeah. Huh? Brandon's doing that now. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And another way of handling the overhead utilities is to put them behind the buildings if you can get the easements. Um, we're working with Skinny Atlas to, to do that on their uh, gateway corridor into the village, through the town. Uh, this slide is just meant to uh, highlight the uh, uh, importance of trees uh, in, in planting in small towns. And if trees exist on a, a property, we should try to keep them there. 
this, uh, that may have been out of, uh, out of sync because now I'm into another uh, slide set. A, a village, a new de village development, which is uh, a combination of single story and two story in a tiny hamlet near Victoria on Vancouver Island uh, is one of my favorites. It's one of the case studies in the book. And the land slopes off to the back, which is where all the parking is. Uh, there's a grocery store right here, which I'll show you in the next slide. There's two stories in front and three stories in back, and uh, there's no parking in front. It's quite far north, as you can tell. <laughs> uh, and the grocery store is here. Their loading dock is there. Uh, and the parking, which is uh, in the back, is located here. And this is a two-story building in front, but a three-story building in back. Mm -hmm. And this was left open because at the time the development was done, there was no sewer. That's where the septic went. Mm -hmm. Now that they've got sewer, I think they might be building more buildings in here, uh, but I, 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 I do not know. I would imagine they put some buildings right in here uh, and, and fill some of that up with parking. So this is a great mixed use uh, example. This is rear parking from a tiny place in, um, on Vancouver Island. In, closer to home uh, in New England, this is a downtown gasoline station in Wickford, Rhode Island. And uh, it was taken over by uh, another owner who got rid of the pumps and the underground tanks. And this is the original building. And he built it higher and closer to the street so that this is what it looks like now, uh, rather than what it used to look like. But now the building extends out to about here, and it goes up to about that high. And it's a, it's a liquor uh, store now. Uh, these dots and images from years ago show how buildings can be built enlarged but closer to the street. So this building here has got an addition that comes to the street. This building here is that building there, but it comes closer to the street, as does this building in there. Uh, all this parking should have been connected in the back. That's one um, missing element in this graphic. But the sidewalk is now much more continuous, as is the street tree planting. So it's bringing the buildings closer to the street, continuing the sidewalk, and having uh, uh, an unbroken line of, of shade trees. Uh, where are we now? This is downtown Belchertown, Massachusetts, near Amherst. And uh, new post office in here, uh, and new building here, old church. Uh, here, and so all the parking is behind, the new building is to the street, and the post office is, you know, doesn't need any street presence whatsoever. So this is what it looks like after development. Uh, this is the new building. This is, I think, the, the parsonage. This is the church. Um, and the parsonage was taken down and a, a bank replaced it. And there's the bank and there's another building here, but there's the post office. So these two buildings are uh, basically you know, oriented to the street, and the parking is in the rear, which also serves the, uh, the post office. And the, 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 the third one in a row that faces the main street is there. Uh, the other two are off to the left, and again, the post office behind. In Sherman, Connecticut, the IGA supermarket is totally invisible to the street. People have this uncanny sixth sense about what their food source is. They do not have to see Hanford sign. They do not have to see Topps sign. Uh, so the uh, town clerk's office, and this is a whole new development they did about, oh, probably 35 years ago at an intersection of Route 39 and another main arterial which is coming in. So this is as much of the town center as they have in this rural town of, uh, of, of uh, Sherman. And this is their fire, fire station, I should mention. So it's partly municipal and partly um, um, there's a bank and this is uh, the, the uh, grocery store. This is what you see. Uh, the fire station is off to the left. And this is new development. These are the trees they kept on site. So you really cannot possibly see the IGA from the road. And the IGA does not suffer. Uh, unfortunately, we don't um, always have regulations in place to stop the trees being 
cut down before there's a site plan that's been considered and re reviewed and approved. Um, with a certain irony that the gentleman called this Pine Tree Plaza. <laughs> in New Hampshire. Um, this is downtown Washington Depot, which was washed away in the flood of 1955. None of this, uh, you know, the buildings that were here were, to were uh, totally swept away. Um, and this is a lovely curving front like the one in Dover, New Hampshire, you saw. And all of these uh, have, are oriented to the street. They're not that particularly close, but you can see the, the major parking is behind there. So you know, a little parking, uh, driving circulation in the front, but it's not a major parking lot by any means. It's just a, sort of an access lane. So all these were built in the late 50s, which is remarkable because in the late 50s we weren't building generally uh, two-story buildings re relating to the street uh, like this with all that shade tree planting. Um, this is the final section of part one, gateway locations. And we're back in Waitsfield, uh, Route 100 uh, is, uh, I think that this is Route 100, right? Yeah, right here. Yeah, is. And uh, this is a new um, retail and uh, post office complex that is in both the original and the new rural by design. It was such a good example that it's one of the few things I carried over from the first edition. And we will also see this one here, Village Square. We're going to start with this one. And this gap. Now, why is there a gap here? Why didn't they build you know, right up to Route 100? No sewers. The only good soils in the property were here. Mm -hmm. So uh, it forced a green space. It forced a gap. And for years, that gap was just a gap. And there, there it is. Uh, and this was the developer's response to the town saying we won't allow a tall pole sign. So he did a silo. And it works. He got a sign. The town got a faux silo, which you know no one really objects to. Um, and here's your subject system. And you can tell exactly the boundaries. <laughs> so um, it was used for nothing until people in the farmer's market said to themselves, why are we in this dinky parking lot downtown? Why don't we go to this larger space full of grass and nice buildings? So they got permission from the owners of the shopping center, who saw this as an opportunity to bring more business to them, uh, as well as you know, the farmer's market, seeing as a good way to bring business to the farmers, because people who are going to the shopping center will go to the farmer's market, and vice versa. And it has been going on now for about 20 years in that location, every Saturday, from, oh, over, I think mid-May to late September. Uh, I'm not sure they have music, but where we lived in Rhode Island, our farmer's market always had uh, music that would just sort of pop up on an unscheduled basis. So what you just saw was this development here. Uh, this is where the septic systems are on the farmer's market. And we're going to migrate over here, but look at how they did this mobile station because we're going to get to that mobile station shortly, and I believe Where is that mobile station? I believe that the mobile station is right there. Yes. And that building is a gorgeous building, and this is the canopy over the pumps. And you cannot get to it from Route 100 except by going around or coming in here. So they did not allow a direct curb cut into it. Uh, but we're going to migrate down here to see another development. But there's your mobile station. And because the canopy slants, um, there was no glare from the lights. This was an error before they discovered they could do recessed lights. It took them a long time to figure out that recessed lights would work in a canopy, but I can't be too critical because it only took the human being 5,000 years to figure out they could put wheels on luggage. <laughs> and not to carry the luggage to the airports. <laughs> you notice the uh, roundabouts. They're not, they're not there yet, as far as I know, but they put in a plan. So you have your vision, you have your plan, you go to DOT, you get on the waiting list, and sooner or later, you'll probably get your roundabouts to define your village, to slow the traffic, um, and <clears throat> I'm confident they will appear. I know in Davis in North Carolina, they had some cloud, and they got the roundabouts within five years. Uh, but that's their, that's their plan. 
and I should also go back to say part of the visioning was all of this is interconnected back in here. It's not what we call an urban grid, but it is connected in the topography and the wetlands and the soils and the terrain make you know an urban grid, a proper urban grid, um, not realistic. But they did get the idea of connectivity and they did all this master planning. And I don't know that any of this actually has been built, but it's not a good idea to have a physical plan even decades in advance and keep looking at it every five years so it just doesn't collect dust for 20 years and become totally out of date and forgotten. Um, this would be a roundabout from Bath, Maine of the type that you would expect to have in Route 100 of Wakefield. Uh, and I like the roundabouts that have a lot of verticality to them. Um, I love the roundabout that's here near the Walmart on the North Side Drive. Uh, but I've yet to see many examples in the United States of real trees uh, like this. This is from Germany. There are just thousands of roundabouts. Uh, a roundabout and a vision plan for uh, Varna, New York, which is in the town of Dryden up near Ithaca, Tompkins County, I think. And this is their vision for in this rural intersection of how to handle the buildings with uh, rather than having the buildings hug the street line, uh, to have the buildings as a crescent uh, or framing some open space. Now you may argue that that's not urban enough, but people of that community said, we don't want to be too urban. We still want to feel like we're you know, rural. So that was their response to that. Since the parking is in the back, I'm, I'm happy with that. Uh, so right here in Bennington, we see a new roundabout, um, which is, um, great uh, addition to Northside Drive. And we see a park in here, which if you stand anywhere in here, you get a, a really, where, where'd it go? I apologize, it's not in there. Uh, Jim Sullivan sent me a great picture, it might surface later, of what you see from here, uh, looking to where. Um, we're gonna finally get down to there and we're gonna close this part one. This is the opposite side of Route 100 and these uh, liner buildings screen the parking, but they give the shopkeepers signage and uh, window space facing Route 100, which you don't get if you're you know way back from the from the roadway. So I always tell you know merchants it's better to have your building closer to the street. Uh, here they did a limited amount of second story. The developer wishes he had done more. These are the windows and signage facing Route 100. The second stories, uh, he said he should have done twice as many because he could rent them to uh, holiday vacationers in the summer and in the winter, skiers as well as the people escaping urban heat. Gateway into uh, Sudbury, Mass, keeping the street line um, and having a sidewalk articulating the facade so it didn't appear too massive by having projecting and recessed elements. That projects, <coughs> that projects, that projects, that recessed, that projects, that recessed, and then having either gables or hip gables uh, really helps to uh, make the building less overwhelming. And the rear parking looks like that, and there may be an aerial photo. Yes, so the first slide you saw was taken in this direction. The second slide was taken in that direction. Uh, and rear parking's there. And the gateway to uh, Jamestown, New York, birthplace of Lucille Ball, is a Harley Davidson as you get off Interstate 86. And that is a metal building, like a Butler building, uh, prefabricated. So it shows, what, and that was done with design money paid by the IDC, the Industrial Development Corporation, for. Chautauqua County. Gateway to Auburn, uh, Massachusetts, another uh, utilitarian metal building, but a much lesser design. If you're going to have a utilitarian building because you don't have the money for better design, then you can at least plant the trees in front of it. And going toward uh, North Bennington, I think there's a pretty good example 
of an industrial building fairly close to Route 67 with a lot of trees planted, maybe 20 of them, in a row between the, the low industrial building parallel to the highway. This is the gateway to Sanford, Maine, which I think is old, uh, much nicer than the gateway to Auburn, Massachusetts. And the answer was, you know, we, we can't fix the, uh, the, the architecture. Uh, we can at least, uh, you know, mask it. Uh, and I'm not a great uh, fan of that. Uh, here's the Staples, which has been improved architecturally, but also landscaped quite a bit in the gateway to Wickford, Rhode Island. And the gateway to York, Maine, uh, U.S. Route 1 design standards I wrote 30 years ago, ran to about four pages. Um, oh, we're going to get to that Bennington picture that Jim sent me in a moment. Because here's a Walmart with a, a walkway to it, uh, and there's an Ikea with a walkway through the parking lot. This is what we really need, is a walkway that goes from the highway right to the front door, through you know a landscaped uh, pedestrian area. And this is the Ikea in New Haven, and this is a redone shopping center in Moscow, Idaho, where the local architecture students from the University of Idaho uh, created this park, which was took the place of some excess parking that was not needed and created these pedestrian routes uh, from one end of the parking lot uh, to, the, to the stores themselves. Uh, I'm going to end here for uh, part one with a picture that shows really the, the need for pedestrian connections um, in parking lots is just as great as the need for pedestrian connections in a downtown where we think nothing of requiring sidewalks along our streets. But when it gets to a shopping center, we don't have that same discipline, that same mindset that we need to have pedestrian routes. Whether we're uh, a, an infant being pushed in a perambulator, whether we're in a top or a toddler holding our parents' hands, whether we're uh, an older person with a cane, or maybe a walker, or maybe a wheelchair, at both ends of the age spectrum, we need to provide more uh, pedestrian provision. So I'll, you know, something to think on while we get our food, and as we come back, I'd like to open up a, you know, a, a mini Q&A session uh, while we eat so that um, questions that arise during this first half you get a chance to, to ask before we get to the second half and to the, to the very end. So I think we're going to ask for someone to put the lights on and we're going to open the doors and I'm, I'm not going to get in the way of 50 people and their food. <laughs> Thank you so, so much. Grab your food and get back. Uh, you know, Vermont does have state design standards that allows for um, you know, significant reductions in lane width, um, in particular in village centers and in downtowns. But you have to know that and you have to fight for that because the, um, the, the highway folks really like to design around the width of plow blades. So, you know, for, for them, the idea is easier to plow the better, the wider the better. Um, so uh, the design standards are there, mistake, but you have to you have to work and you have to push to get what you want. So anyway, Randall. Okay. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, as we continue to uh, enjoy the dinner, um, if there are questions we can field before moving into the part two, uh, be glad to entertain any questions or comments or things that maybe you expected I'd cover and I haven't so far. Yes. Um, thank you for coming, Randall. Um, I'm uh, the Janet. I'm the Planning and Zoning Director of Manchester. And we recently, for the first time in 40 years, completely comprehensively <coughs> rewrote the zoning ordinance and have these zoning districts. And some of the more controversial elements had to do with height of buildings, um, the um, increased height and we also wanted to require two stories in our downtown. And we met a lot of, that's where we met most of our resistance was a requirement for two stories. Um, and we ended up getting it with a little bit of a, um, a caveat that the select board threw in at the end, and that was that if 
a use. Wanted to, if somebody wanted to put a use in in a new building where having a second floor was incompatible, um, then it could be waived. Um, and you know, they, I can't really think of a of a use that would be allowable in our downtown that would be incompatible with the second floor. But we had to let that okay. go. But that picture of the car wash <laughs> in Maine, I want you to share with me. <laughs> yes, right there. It's actually in Dover, New Hampshire. Uh, oh, and no, year, right. years ago, when I wanted to take bad examples, I never wanted to take them in Maine because that's where I was working. And I didn't want to criticize the people I was working with in Maine. So I go over to Dover. Right. And the Dover was full of bad examples. Right. Then, uh, that was 30 years ago. Right. And Dover's turned around. You know. So in, in Manchester, okay, well, I want to just respond to that. In Manchester, Vermont, the second story requirement was controversial, but it was written and approved with a caveat that if there was a, a use that was inappropriate to have a second story, it would not be required. Now, I have heard many, many stories about uh, drug stores. <coughs> Walgreens, CVS, Rite Aid, we can't have a second story because people will drill holes through the ceiling and get into our areas with all the, you know, uh, controlled substances, shall we say. Interestingly, if you go to urban areas where the same chains have outlets on the ground floor of a 10-story building, they obviously have a second story above that they don't own. <laughs> Uh, Rite Aid in Camden agreed to build a second story, but they just filled it with trusses so it could never ever be used. It looks fine from the street, but they were deliberately... I think we used that picture in our, that Rite Aid picture in our presentation. Yeah. It, it, it's, a, it's a good example of an exterior appearance that works. Yeah. And I think I've got it in this slideshow, I'm not absolutely positive, <clears throat> I think I do. Uh, but if I don't, let me just say that it's in the book. I can send it to anybody they want. Um, but they have the same Rite Aid floor plan, which is pretty wide. But on the streets, it looks like three different buildings. <coughs> and there are different heights and different roof treatments. So it works very, very well. Um, but they were not able to require a functional second story, whereas in Gainesville, Florida, they were. In, in Davidson, North Carolina, they were. Uh, and it's, it's a lot of bunk because there. I could also send you pictures of a lot of drug stores with second stories above from the same chains that profess that they cannot possibly do business in that dangerous manner.
perception that there's a parking problem when people expect to be able to park, you know, right next to the storefront. Whereas they would go to the mall outside of Albany where you have all the big box stores and probably walk, you know, a mile by the time they're done with all the what they're doing. <coughs> exactly the right. Place. Yeah, it would be good to have a scale of one of those malls yeah. and superimpose it upon Manchester yeah. Yeah. Center. Actually, and, that's and, and, and this is the distance you walk in Albany, but in Manchester you suddenly lose your legs. <laughs> right, right, right. That's a good idea. There must be something about all these people grow longer, like more stamina. Right. Yeah. Other, yeah, yes. a question. Um, you showed a couple of slides, I think it was Lowell, where you had pilasters, cast iron pilasters and lintels, and then a few slides in beyond that, there were modern pseudo replicas of those, and you said that that's part of the, 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 that's part of the actual building documentation that they have to do that. Did I, mis did I misinterpret that? Because what I'm getting at is, is there a way that we can write into our building code some level of requirement for maintaining the aesthetic of the town? And maybe that's already been done, because I'm not a part of that. Sorry. I think you can. Um, with, the, with blazing on the front, well, I, I think you can require the transom effect. People might just put glass and peanut glass on the side if they are going to look at a lower, lower ceiling with the hangers. Right. And <coughs> below the windowsill, you could not necessarily require glass or plexiglass, but panels that are painted black, glossy black, right. that from across the street, mm -hmm. can, they mimic that effect. Uh, I think the important thing <coughs> is. The really important thing is to get that shop front up for five inches from the sidewalk on some kind of raised plinth, poured concrete or limestone or granite. Uh, you do not really have to have those that the effect of the stall riser windows below the, the shop window frame, because not, in Victorian times, Edwardian times, not all buildings had those glazed ways for daylight to get to the cellar or coal to, to move from the sidewalk to the cellar. Not every building had it. Right. But if you're going to, uh, it's something to promote as an idea for a bit more authentic, authenticity. Uh, right, that's what I was getting. And I'm also thinking that, and again, it's not my purview, so I don't know if it's already been done. But it would be, to me, one of the biggest decisions that could be made would be to follow the concept of using MDO instead of cheap plywood um, to make sure that the that those spaces are more durably built and to have some kind of requirement for what that means to either be painted plastic such as the PVC molding type stuff or to have mm -hmm. the MDO that's painted as opposed to plywood or um, cheap paneling or something like yeah. that. Just because it's hard enough to keep a town looking <clears throat> spiffy when you're working at it, but if you're making it look spiffy by putting 10 cent products in place instead of five dollar products in place, then it's even harder. Yeah, when, when my builder put an addition onto the kitchen, all the uh, framing boards around the windows and the doors were that one by four uh, product, which is a, a plastic product. But it, it's paintable. You don't have to paint it if you want to just keep it white. Um, but it, it lasts almost, you know, forever. Yes. That, that, that is better than MDO, but it, that is a, a step up in cost. But right. it's only used for the, the, the framing around a panel or framing around a window or a door. The cost isn't. The, co the cost increases. Is small. And, and one more final comment. I'll be real quick. That looking at a lot of the slides that you've shown us. There's another example of the idea of having the storefronts very close to the street and the parking behind that, had, that has been landscaped and has been thoughtfully done. There's an excellent example of that in downtown South Hadley, Mass. Because there's a little, there's a mall, if you will, right on the center square. And it's right on the street. 
and there's huge amounts of parking right behind it that are tiered in, in levels because it's a sloping it's, it's sloping space. Oh, I was supposed to say, what town is that in? South Hadley. South Hadley. It's right. In, it's just just adjacent to the uh, Mount Holyoke College. Oh, the center square. I think that I, it's a big development. Yeah, it's a sizable space. There are I, theaters and yeah, multiple I restaurants. That. It's I think three stories tall. I didn't put it in the slideshow because it, it's pretty massive, and I thought it would be right. It probably doesn't take photos. Yeah, no, it's actually in the book. Wow. I've known that since I lived in Amherst in, in the mid '80s. It's right. a great film called Village Commons. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you might Google it, or you might get the book, or you might get the book. <laughs> <laughs> or I said the case study for nothing. You know, yeah, that, that works too. too. Yeah, uh, 30 years on, there's a school of thought that says that the Americans with Disabilities Act has devalued our historic downtown buildings because converting them is quite a bit more expensive than building out on the strip, single story buildings. All the national chains know how to do this now, and um, the downtowns are languishing as a result. Your comments? Uh, I think downtowns are languishing as a result of a lot of things. Um, when you consider the amount of floor space in a Walmart and consider the amount of retail space in downtown Bennington, uh, it's, it's pretty awesome how uh, the purchasing power that they can have. That they can practically put uh, rubber made out of business by saying, we won't buy your product unless you sell it to us for 49 cents. And they, they, are, they, they use their muscle to get the prices low for the consumer, but at a cost as well uh, to firms, to employees in those firms that can't meet that, uh, to where they buy a lot of their products from. I always thought that Walmart should have a direct tunnel to China uh, rather than transporting it around the globe, just running it right through the center of the earth. Because so much of their stuff comes from overseas. Um, it's, it's a trend which has been a long, long time in building. Um, I wouldn't, I, I hear what you're saying about the ADA and it making it expensive, and it does, to rehabilitate downtown buildings to be in compliance. Might there be a way to get waivers from that for <coughs> historic buildings <coughs> in downtowns. I don't know, uh, but I have worked in historic preservation. I don't know that it's beyond the realm of possibility that you get some exceptions to that. But I think that's one of many pressures on downtowns, why it's so difficult for those merchants to compete. Uh, Well, Walmart is a great example because we've just opened 122,000 square foot Walmart built on a redeveloped site, mostly Greenfield. And, um, you know, Walmart knows how to do accessibility in every aspect, total compliance. So, where's the incentive to rehab a historic building downtown where even the, the, the duplex outlets are at the wrong height? These are good points. Um, how is the Putnam Block developer approaching that? Uh, the, their statement is that nobody in their right mind would spend <coughs> this amount of money on these buildings. No private developer would ever do this. And, and I think there are developers. Right. Where's their money coming from? They're printing it. The stand a little bit on the code. I'm a code guy. And uh, I'm, I'm watching existing buildings, old buildings, being significantly changed. Over 50% of the, of the square footage of the building. I got electrical code, you're talking structural load, ventilation, the entire gamut. Obviously, they're very successful and they're absolutely beautiful. How do you navigate that? I mean, how do you? That's my head was exploding. I'm thinking, going through, and thinking, okay, the electrical code and uh, and wiring, and ventilation, uh, live load, dead load. Uh, fire code, exits, exit egress. I mean, I'm just going, you know. Those are questions that are better addressed by an architect because they get into some really important detail for the right. double lies, and right. that's 
not an area that I can speak to with any, so just, uh, so any knowledge on my part. I didn't mean to convolute anything, I just want to make sure. Yeah. I think, you know, one, one final question before we go to part two, and then we're going to have questions after that. Yes, sir. Uh, Randall, just, just to stay on the ADA and the code thing, um, I think that in Vermont there is a reality uh, relative to building codes that historic structures are unique and cannot meet every absolute component of codes. And the state and locally in Bennington where we have our own control of the state's codes and our own enforcement of the state's codes, um, we are constantly finding ways to achieve equivalent accessibility or equivalent code compliance in ways that don't destroy the fabric of historic buildings. So I, I think that there's another optimistic look here, uh, is that we're trying to work from the state's perspective uh, with the glass half full as opposed to the glass half empty. And I, I, uh, your points about it potentially being expensive um, are true, um, but for instance, the Putnam Block, it would be expensive regardless of where the new electrical outlets were going to be. Right. Uh, and so, um, I, I, I feel, I'm a code guy too, and I feel that, that we in Vermont have found a way to, 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 to gel uh, both of those ends of the spectrum. I, I do have a question though. I'm Michael McDonough, I'm the chair of the uh, Bangkok Planning Commission. I also serve on the Vermont Downtown Board. Uh, first of all, we are very grateful, as, as has been said, uh, that you are spending this evening with us tonight. Uh, we're in the process of uh, beginning discussions about ways in which uh, we can make our bylaw simpler uh, and shorter uh, and uh, perhaps more clearly representative of the visions that we that we have. Uh, we do think that that our bylaw uh, and I'm getting to the point where I'm, I, I, the bylaw is an old term. Uh, our, our land use and development regulations are perhaps the the, the better uh, term, and maybe getting the word regulations out of there wouldn't be a bad idea either. But um, I, my, my question, or my reassurance uh, from you, uh, would be this. Um, we had some trepidation about what you might be telling us tonight uh, relative to how we can incorporate um, form-based principles into what we think is at its root of, of pretty sound uh, land use regulation uh, and, and how we can enhance that. Um, am I right that what we're hearing is that in no means do we have to, or by no means do we have to start over, uh, that it's a matter of, of taking the form based principles and melding them with our existing land use regulations uh, to achieve a better product. And is that Yes. Yes. Sir. yes. yes. Uh, I, I think that the form-based code was created by new urbanist architects, but largely, that weren't familiar with land use planning techniques or only saw the mistakes. That's my personal take on it. I mean, they created a whole new way of looking at the world where you know density and land use you know types were irrelevant. Um, and saying just if you regulate form, everything is fine. And I, I, uh, I just think that shows how they're living in kind of a parallel universe. And also saying we don't need to have planning boards and citizen participation in the review process. To me, that, that, that just doesn't, that means they haven't spent enough time in New England. <laughs> <laughs> they don't know how the world works here. So yes, Freeport, Maine, years ago, had a good set of design standards. Manchester, uh, I, you know, concentrating on maximum uh, front setback and minimum height, or you know, having that second story requirement. Those are the two cornerstones of this. Everything else, that's like ninety percent. Uh, but the other ten percent is important too, like the glazing standard where the front door is. Um, the mixtures of uses, yes. those are important too, but 90% is get the building closer to the street and make it more than one story. Is it fair to say, I'm not sure, 
Uh, is it fair to say that uh, incorporating those standards does not preclude um, new and innovative architectural approaches to downtown buildings? Uh, or the reverse to say uh, uh, that downtown buildings don't have to always have to be retro uh, in order to exactly be successful? Exactly right. 30 years ago, almost, when I worked in downtown Lowell Historic District, we said that if it's a new building, we don't want someone 30 years from now confusing it with an original building. It needed to have uh, pay respect in terms of uh, the rhythm of the windows and the proportions of the windows, uh, you know, narrower than, than, than wide, uh, the, the types of materials, the color of materials. Those have been in down in historic district standards for, for decades. But they can be you know, brought into these codes as well for any type of downtown district, I think, uh, without requiring it be retro at all. When McDonald's in Freeport, Maine, and that will come up, I'm almost certain, uh, when they did their addition, because they were prohibited by Freeport from demolishing the existing old house on the property, they said, incorporate that old house into a newer building. And they kept the, the building in front, the old one, and the addition was built with cleaner lines, but the same proportions, the same roof shape, the same roofing material, the same cladding. But you would never think that it was all uh, dating from the 19th century. That's in the old rural by design and the new one, and I'm almost positive you'll see it up here. Right. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, so I need to move into part two and keep the pace. Um, <coughs> Rural highway locations, this was built over a number of years after World War II on Route 9 going from Kennebunk down to Kennebunk Port. Uh, and the original building actually is this one here. And that's the second one and the third one, the fourth one. And they, there were no codes at the time. But it shows, well, it's a good example in post-war times of how people could do the right thing without regulations. You ever wonder why in a historic district back in the 19th century they did things so well with no regulations? And they had uh, carpenter Gothic and they had Italianate, they had Greek Revival, they had mixtures and they had Queen Anne and it all worked. And why did it work well? Because they're all working within the same kind of overall uh, you know, uh, approach to construction. Um, just the details change. So back in the 19th century, we didn't need regulations to build great downtowns and to build great residential neighborhoods. And this is one of the few examples I've seen. And I'd say the Queens Byway in Falmouth is another pretty good example that predate zoning of how you can do something that, that really works and, and uh, looks like it belongs and has been there for, for centuries. Those buildings are right here. And in more recent years, they built another one out back with all the parking is right there. Um, this is up near where I live uh, in Maine, and that's a veterinary clinic up near Walterboro, which is just past Wiscasset. Um, and closer to Brunswick, uh, between Brunswick and Freeport, is the Wilden Market. Uh, they do have front parking, it's gravel, it's not massive. Uh, it works uh, partly because the front parking is, is, is really very minimal. They've got, some side parking as well. Um, this is a you know a larger example, uh, and where is that? That's from Pennsylvania, Newtown, Pennsylvania. I'm almost positive. So, uh, like some of the new dealerships on Northside Drive, the the amount of paving in front has been really reduced, uh, and the the cars are stacked to the side. This is a a new uh, building maybe 20 years old, from the <coughs> northeastern corner of Connecticut, up near Putnam. Uh, and I could tell you where later on, I just forget the name of the town. But behind it is a massive one-story building of no great uh, you know, architectural distinction. Not that this is great architectural distinction, but other, if they did, hadn't done that in the front, it would have just been your standard uh, Industrial Park, one-story flat roof building. And this is out in the country, it's in Pomfret. I'm almost positive now, Pomfret. Uh, so this is what you see from the road, and they're, they're hiding the standard industrial park building behind it. 
But it's all functional, it's not faux. That, that, that floor space is used. Um, and what you saw is right here. And what is hidden is back in there. And the picture was taken from here. This is a development I designed, not architecturally, but the site plan in West Benson Township near Philly in Chester County. And uh, we, uh, in order to have maximum visibility for the shops, we put them at right angles to the road. So from the road, you could see in this direction, that line of shops, or in the road from that direction, this line of shops. But the parking did not dominate it. Was, it, it came as far as the street as this, but it wasn't in between the buildings and the street. That's the highway back in there, and this is looking back to the highway. And this is what you see from the air, and the first picture was taken there. In Middlebury, Connecticut, a grocery store is behind the bank and part of the same building. Another example of where the grocery store is in Turbin, Connecticut, it could be totally hidden. Uh, so the grocery store, the bank goes to about here, and then the grocery store is all back in there. And in the aerial photograph, you'll see the loading dock is back in the corner where that tree is turned yellow. Loading dock is in here. The last picture was taken in this direction. The first picture was taken in that direction. There's a second building, and it goes down a slope. So instead of having an elevator or a lift, they do their top floor loaded from this side and their bottom floor loaded from that side, and it works very, very well. So when you ever, ever have a change in elevation on a site, there's an opportunity to have a, a two-story building without a lift. Um, th this is in a hamlet in uh, the Poconos region of Pennsylvania. And these are two-story buildings with the parking in the back, and this is what they look like from the front. And I, I think the architecture is just too phony colony, uh, but I like it because of the building placement and the second story and the rear parking. Uh, they didn't have design standards uh, on the building, but I, you know, functionally it, it works very well, you know, with the parking in the back, which is behind in that direction. This is a, a standalone building from the same development. Uh, a sketch that I did while working in Pennsylvania to show uh, buildings lining the, the main streets with the parking in the back. This be a green, which is also a uh, stormwater management area. Um, when we lived in Narragansett, Rhode Island, this was uh, a, a new development I passed by every day at Tower Hill, where it had the same relationship to the road as the last sketch you saw, and the. There's a stone wall here which kind of screens, it goes around the corner, that's right at the corner and it goes around the corner to that stone wall which screens the parking. Um, sometimes old stone walls can be incorporated into it, other times new stone walls are just built um, as it was done here with stone wall kitchen uh, and Route 1 York, which met the design standards I wrote for York, Maine 30 years ago. Um, Route 116 in um, North Conway, New Hampshire. The original building is here, and the new building um, paid respect to it in terms of the roof pitch, the roof color, the, the cladding is, is quite clabbered. Um, but you never think that this was a Victorian building, but it, it, it relates to that, and I think that's the important thing. It relates to it, it's more than a single story and the parking is where it belongs, in the back. Uh, this is jumping back to Rhode Island, uh, a new office uh, building in Lincoln, Rhode Island. Uh, and again, it, it, it harkens back to the shoe shops that were built in the 19th century without trying to mimic them down to you know, the details of the windows or even the details of, of, of the uh, the siding or the, the roof pitch, but it harkens sufficiently, I think, to fit in much better than a contemporary building would have done. And the owner probably said that this rented up much more quickly than a competitor of his that did the standard uh, steel box with uh, you know, glass walls and, con and concrete block walls, which was just you know, a quarter of a mile from him. People wanted to you know, be in that complex because it felt better. It felt more like New England. 
Well, when you can't really improve the architecture and you're stuck, uh, you know, buffering is, is, is a good thing. So these trees were kept in front of this building here, which is not something that I would normally put in my slideshow, except for the fact that you can't see it from uh, Route 116 in North Conway. Uh, when you can't uh, work with the gasoline station, uh, the gasoline company, to have rear pumps or to do something you know, dramatically different with the architecture, you know, a hedge that's 42 inches high um, does help to mitigate the visual impact that the standard gasoline station would otherwise have. Um, this is a Walmart somewhere in New Hampshire, uh, and it reminded me of the view you get from certain locations here in Bennington of the new Walmart, where there's a lot of open space in front. In this case, there's a lot more open space between the highway and the Walmart than there is in Bennington, but um, I'm not sure that this was, this is still undeveloped. This may have been an out parcel that was developed later. Uh, but for many years, it looked just like that. So this is a really, really nice view of this Walmart. Um, and I think it was done extremely well. The building uh, was handled as well as I've ever seen any Walmart. And the park is lovely. I just wish the park had extended more and, and not been just one you know, wedge. But it's a great park for what it is. And is that where it is. Second story? No. I doubt it. No. It's no. probably no. just uh, the front. It's probably a false front. Walmart is pretty famous for false fronts. <laughs> Dan, uh, Jim, I'm sorry, uh, but you did miss the monument in the background. <laughs> shame, shame on you. It's the only Walmart with a historic national historic site in the background. Yeah. So the, the, the photograph you just saw that Jim Sullivan took was taken somewhere in here. That bank is a repurposed Wendy's. Pardon me? That bank in the front is a repurposed Wendy's. Oh, it is? A repurposed Wendy's? Yeah. So I can't get Frosties there. Oh, dang. <laughs> but I can get a 15-month CD for 2%. That's better than Frosties. Leaving the trees in front can be a requirement. I'm not sure it was a requirement in this situation, but it, and it doesn't have to be as deep as that, but I think you can require that existing vegetation remain. It might be thinned, it might be limbed, so you can see uh, through the trees and it's not totally obscured. I think you saw that sign before, it's one of my favorites. Uh, this church is across the street from that church. And clearly, the Town. This is uh, Manchester, North Concord, New Hampshire. I was going to say it's Manchester, New Hampshire. It's Concord, New Hampshire. Did not have regulations. This congregation just uh, had a few druids in it, <laughs> and this one didn't. <laughs> well, the congregation was focused on the building, and focused on the fundraising, and never questioned the the engineer that laid out the parking lot. Had they had a fuller discussion, had they had site plan review required. The whole idea of front parking and taking out the existing trees, which I'm sure it had, uh, would have been a matter of discussion, but without the regulations, it wasn't, and that was built. And this is almost directly across the street. It's, there are just two churches uh, praying to the same God, but in, I guess in a different way. Um, back in Pennsylvania, in Phoenixville, um, these are trees that were planted perhaps 15, 20 years ago. Um, to buffer this building, new building and new parking lot, where they, 20 years ago, didn't really think about bringing the building forward and putting the parking behind. So I put this in the slideshow in, in areas where you might do a retrofit or you don't have the regulations to require that the building be closer to the street and the parking be <coughs> subordinated. This grand union, um, eventually petered out in North Hoosick, or Hoosick Falls, one of the two. And this berm here, I think, was accidental. I think it was just you know, a hill that was there, and they didn't finish clearing it. And for years, it just kept as kind of a screen, an accidental screen. Unfortunately, when Grand Union left, 
cops came in and leveled it, which was, I thought, the only redeeming characteristic. <laughs> You gotta, you know, keep your eyes on these guys. <laughs> uh, in Chautauqua County, um, where they didn't think about maybe having been Bob Evans closer to the street and having the front parking, they threw up a berm and planted trees on it, and that's pretty effective. But I, I've always thought that berms are an admission of design failure. <laughs> if you can't do something right, hide it. It's that line of trees that I showed in, on, in front of the factory going into Sanford, Maine, as opposed to the, the uh, Auburn, Massachusetts gateway where the factory had no trees. So trees and berms are there when you can't do something better, but they're not bad as a fallback. This is from uh, Fisher's, Fisherville near Louisville, Kentucky, and that's a Circle K gasoline station, and I'll show you four pictures of it. And for a gasoline station with the front pumps, it's pretty good, but you can't do that on Northside Avenue. So I think you did a pretty good thing with the Cumberland Farms, bringing that, that Cumberland Farms building closer to the, the corner and subordinating the gas pumps uh, to the side uh, where they're visually much less prominent. Uh, we could do a lot better with landscaping parking lots. Uh, and I, my standard is like, uh, you know, uh, one tree for every 300 square, 800 square feet. So that, that puts a lot of trees, it, be, it becomes a parking grove. But what's wrong with having a parking grove instead of an asphalt lot? And you can use the stormwater for uh, irrigation, you see. This is the Best Western, not in Bennington, where I'm staying tonight, but a Best Western in Rockford, Illinois, where I stayed several years ago. And, and I saw the number of trees there, and I counted the number of trees per parking space, and it was, it was quite a lot. It was one tree for eight spaces. There were spaces on both sides of the trees. So I counted the trees, I counted the spaces, it says it's one tree for eight spaces. And my wife says, uh, well, you're never gonna get anyone in America to uh, you know, follow that. Uh, and I think, well, you know, maybe we can get close to it because if a Best Western in the middle of Illinois can do it, why can't we do it here in New England where we care uh, at least as much about, you know, our communities? Uh, there's a parking lot from uh, Gardner, Maine, or close to Gardner. Um, I'd have to, I have to admit that I forget where that is, but a friend of mine, did those standards, one tree for eight spaces, and says this is what it would look like. And that's the park and grow. And why not? <clears throat> Are they going to say we're not going to build our Hannaford's in town if you do that? I doubt it. They've done their market studies. They know that they're going to sell a ton of groceries here because of the location, because of the size of the community, your highway connections. So they're not going to say no. This is a Hannaford's in New York, Maine, where I wrote the design standards years ago. And it's back from Route 1 because there's no place on Route 1 to build it. But you go you know, in uh, to see it from here. This is the sign. It's not the Hannaford building. That's just a monument sign. You go in this drive, and that's what you see. So. We can learn from other communities that did what sometimes we might think is impossible. Now, th this is just themed as to uh, specific types of car uses. And clearly, Bennington is not got something ugly like that. Uh, and you, I think the newer car uses are done pretty well. But I haven't seen as many trees in front. I see <coughs> fewer cars, but I haven't seen as many trees in front. So that's something that I would, would add if I had a chance to go back and take a second bite at the apple at those new car dealerships here, is to put you know, trees every 40 feet at, or at most, maybe every 30 or 35 feet. That they're, they're limbed up. So the car dealers can't say, well, you won't see our cars, or you won't see our building. They're limbed up so that you can see through from the highway to the building. Um, 
these are just you know very well landscaped as examples. So instead of having 30 cars, they got three in, a, in landscape settings. So if they really want to show off cars close to the highway, which is what they apparently want to do, don't show 30 cars because they won't stand out. They're just a mass. Um, should pick out three or four examples, like pick up you know, a, a high-end car, a, a budget car, and put them out in you know, landscape areas and, and make them special. And every week they can be rotated. So those are you know, landscape platforms. That's from Mechanicsville, uh, Virginia. Um, this is Wilmington Pike, so that's probably uh, Delaware. But I'm not sure. Doesn't look like Massachusetts to me. But it might be. This is New Jersey, a state that I grew up in and left at age 18. Um, car washes can be pretty functional, or they can be pretty nice, quite close to the sidewalk, side entry. Same with this. This is in Brunswick, uh, Route 24, going between Bowdoin College and Cook's Corner. Uh, rear pumps, uh, can't always have them. The Cumberland Farms was a good, a very good uh, resolution on a site that really didn't allow rear pumps. Um, but here's one where the site did allow rear pumps. It's on Route 24 in Thompson, Maine, just north of uh, Brunswick. And uh, the convenience store is here, and the entrance to the convenience store is from the parking lot. So this, these are just, you know, basically, uh, those are faux windows, completely faux, and those are probably as well. And that's because they want to have wall space to put their shelves up against. Downtown Lowell, we had big storefront windows in Victorian buildings, and people put their racks of merchandise backing up to the windows. And I was in charge of the historic district at that time, and the compromise solution we came to was, let's paint the bottom half of your windows black from the inside so you don't see the, the racks of all the, the uh, merchandise, which was facing the other direction anyway. It was facing to the interior of the store. And the rest of the glass was kept clear so you could see you know, into uh, the upper half of the store. I'm not a great fond of faux windows, but they're better uh, than no windows, and they're particularly good if they're black plexiglass because then they reflect and they look more real than those do. But the main purpose of this slide is to show the, the rear pumps. Uh, not the only example. This is from um, Kingston, Rhode Island, a mobile. The mobile sign is just off the picture. I'm not sure why it's not in that picture. There's, the, uh, there's that mobile and there's the pumps behind. This is from Rhinebeck, New York, another mobile. Rhinebeck again, that's looking at the side of the building with the pumps in the back. And that's the aerial photograph of that. Last photo was taken from here. Hardware stores can look like this and very much the same type of building is this, but the landscaping and the kind of the architecture is, you know, improved. The stormwater is down in here in a, in a, in a rain garden infiltration gallery. Uh, a standard uh, ACE hardware store, single story, was improved. Uh, this was in Minnesota where that uh, type of peeled log construction, as you would see in Yosemite uh, as well, peeled log construction is kind of uh, local um, vernacular. But just the entranceway uh, made a big difference in the way that building looked. Autobody repair can look like this mm -hmm. or like that with the big garage doors in the back and the, all the asphalt and the car storage in the back rather than this. Here's one from downtown York, uh, York Village in the back. Uh, this is from upstate New York and this is from downstate New York, uh, Warwick, uh, Rhode Island, original stone wall incorporated and this is their parking area and the garage bays are facing the parking area. Uh, back in Maine, I think that's in Thompson again, the back view. Um, tire place, another tire place from Middlebury, you might know that Goodyear. It's no longer a Goodyear, but it's 
still a tire place, I think. There it is, Rouse Tire. This is from a recent Google Earth shot. So that's the building that you see here. So rural highway locations can have that, you know, kind of lower density look, more country look. Self storage can look like that or like this. That's just a color change, really, and a, a, a little bit of a roof pitch. But that's a, a, the best example I've ever seen. On Route 1, Westerly, Rhode Island, it's a, a front which is more or less faux here, but functional in here. This is their real office. And that stone wall is a new stone wall they built. Drug stores can look like this. And sadly, you know, a lot of these are single story. Freeport, Maine, early years of their design ordinance. Not a great example, but I'd say better than this, particularly because of the location re relation to the ship to the street. And Cape Cod, CBS actually built a Cape Cod style building. And the Rite Aid in Camden, and right in goes from here all the way down to there. Those three buildings are one building. Those are faux windows. These are faux second stories. And that's sad because they did it out of spite. They, they could have had functional floor space here, rented out to people that would uh, not drill down for the controlled substances. They could, put the control, <laughs> they could have put their controlled substances there, you know, <laughs> with, no, with nothing above except, you know, crows. Could that be retrofitted or it's not? Pardon me? Could they retrofit that to put another story up there or not? Probably not. Yeah. Um, I didn't hear that all. Could they retrofit it? it Not so easily, so. because they deliberately put all kinds of trusses up here. Uh -huh. So it looks great. It looks smashing from the street. But that shows the, the obstinacy of some of these national firms. We'll comply, but we damn well won't give you a second story that, that anyone can use, except mice, bass. <laughs> Fast food restaurants, Wendy's. Uh, that one does not repurpose as a bank. Uh, this is one from uh, Scarborough, Maine, a bit better. Dunkin' Donuts, I think, isn't there one here in Bennington that is now an Asian restaurant? It has that same roofing. I think that would be Route 9, east of Four Corners. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's take that out. It's a takeout place, right? <laughs> we should buy them out and put a two-story two -story building there and, and, and uh, have, have the... Uh, Asian restaurant still there on the ground floor of a three-story building. I think this just cut out uh, of a three-story building so that it looked a lot better. Now, the next two examples, sadly, are not multi-story buildings, but this is done up in uh, Hyde Park maybe 30 years ago. Um, and I don't know what kind of design standards they had then. This is done in Charleston, Rhode Island on Route 1. So it's rural. And uh, you can't have multi-story buildings, you know, out on, you know, federal highways uh, to any great extent. But we certainly could have them more in downtown locations in, and in gateway locations. Dairy Queens can look like that or like this. Uh, this is from uh, a town in Ohio. Uh, the name will come to me. And they have a huge set of design standards there. It's not Hudson, uh, not Dayton. It'll it will come to me. Arby's, uh, sorry, that should not be there. But you see the Arby's in the sign, uh, and that's the one from Freeport, Maine. Arby's uh, has since uh, relocated to another spot. Uh, they left Freeport entirely, and this is now a uh, you know, regular sit-down restaurant. McDonald's, Laurel, uh, New York, design standards. Um, British Columbia, design standards, stone wall too. Freeport, Maine, and this is the new addition, done about 30 years ago by Stephen Moore, who really understood Maine architecture. This is the old original building. I've shown this slide in a lot of locations, and uh, I've always wondered why McDonald's hasn't put this into their annual report to show how they can really fit into a community and save an historic building. And one, I finally uh, met up with a McDonald executive, and he said, are you kidding? 
If we ever put this into our annual reports, every town in America would require us to do this kind of thing. <laughs> Which is exactly why I show this slide wherever I go. It's, it's very valuable ammunition. So that's the building they saved. And the interior is great. They even installed wow. new cherry wainscoting, uh, you know, from the windowsills down. Original flooring, original fireplaces. And the, the, the big uh, controversy what came five, a few years later, should they be allowed to have a takeout? And uh, people said, no, we shouldn't have a takeout. And other people said, what's the problem? And uh, the latter uh, prevailed. And it hasn't been a problem. Historic takeout. So if you want to go there, you can, you can use the takeout, but I recommend the room with the fireplace. <laughs> and it's not a faux fireplace. <laughs> um, and getting toward the end, nighttime standards with uh, glare. Uh, these are the old pop-down lights, not the recessed, but for years and years. Um, that was standard, and then we came into the recessed with LEDs and it reduced the glare quite a bit. Uh, those are the, the ones that are not recessed, and these were the alternative to the, uh, the non-recessed lights to have a bit of a pitch, signage, a lot of glare with white plastic signs internally lit. Plastic signs that are internally lit, I think, could still fit in, but need to have an opaque background. This could be red or blue or green in the daytime, but in the night, no light is transmitted through it, so it's white on black. Or it could be a, a metal sign or a wooden sign that has you know, uh, lamps which illuminate it in that way. Uh, instead of having pole signs, monument signs are becoming much more standard. Uh, signs like this are, I think, becoming less ubiquitous. Um, in Amherst, Massachusetts, this became the alternative. Um, four by four posts and beams, exterior grade plywood, covered by indoor-outdoor carpet, plaster, plastic letters uh, with Velcro tabs, and they could change the, the sign you know, every day, every week, however often they wanted to. And it had the same functionality as this. Uh, and they actually gave a local carpenter some work to do and fits in so much better. I'm going to conclude with some stormwater issues with just a few slides showing a, a retrofit opportunity. Uh, you could dig that up and, and do something there. Uh, th this curbing here really fights the idea of managing stormwater well because it goes down into a drain and then it goes down into a stream or into some big pit rather than into a rain garden. And this tree is starved of water because it's you know elevated up here. So this, this is obviously designed by an engineer and not a landscape architect who would have said, we, let's have the tree get some irrigation rather than putting the tree on a desert island surrounded by a concrete uh, you know, uh, wall. So if you, the, the concrete walls are fine as wheel stops so your car doesn't go into the, the bushes, but they should have V-notches and all the pavement should be, you know, pitched to the uh, to the central uh, islands. They have one like this on the Bowdoin College campus, except they haven't landscaped it. But it functions the same way. But uh, I'm working with the, the campus, you know, people to to landscape it well, because with a billion dollar endowment, you know, they could afford a few plants. Uh, this is what a rain garden looks like in cross section, and sometimes they have a grass uh, a sand column. So when the water comes in, it goes down very quickly. There might be crushed stone, and that irrigates the, the deep root zone for the tree. So the water just doesn't you know, pond up in here, but it gets down to where the roots want to go. Uh, here's a new rain garden from uh, Milford, uh, PA, up in the Poconos. Done extremely well, I think. This is from uh, St. Paul, where they get a lot of snow. Um, and red maples grow extremely well as do uh, river birches. This is a new Goodwill in Rockland, Maine. And there are two pictures of their, uh, their rain gardens in a new parking lot for a new Goodwill on US Route 1. They can be landscaped to be absolutely gorgeous with lots of different plant materials. This is from a Home Depot from Route 4 in, uh, in the south of Providence in North Kingstown, Rhode Island. 
and it is, you can see the Home Depot sign there. It was just a great big pit that they created, uh, and then they landscaped it in various layers, from the reeds at the edge to shrubs to trees, and it has worked really, really well. Here's an early view of it. That's uh, the, the, the divided highway route four, which goes down to Narragansett Beach. Um, so if Home Depot can do that, Walmart can do it, Lowe's can do it, everybody can do it. Um, and if you build it, they will come. And there's no Photoshop there. Um, so I think that may be my last slide. Yeah. So stormwater is something that we've begun to think about more and more in the recent five to 10 years. But there's such a wide variety in the way that stormwater basins are designed, both functionally and aesthetically, that I think there's a lot more work, a lot more thought that we need to put into our, our codes and ordinances, because they can become part of that uh, green uh, space that we, we need in the middle of an asphalt expanse um, for a lot of reasons. So I'm going to open it up for another round of questions uh, on anything I touched on or maybe something that you thought I might but didn't somehow. Yeah. Where's the example? I mean, you must have examples of, co of, of towns in which this was implemented. I'm, I'm trying to see. I, I, I see all these, these concepts. Now, how does it get translated into a document that, that, that guides development? Well, I've tried to name every town with a slide. Uh, occasionally, it hasn't come up. But of the 300 slides, I think probably I identified. When I identify them, I so, the cool. sounds the so you want to know where that was, that was North Kingstown, Rhode Island, um, and I used to know the plan of there, but they, they had they come and go. By if there's a particular picture there that you'd like to have, I can email it to you, and I can tell you where it's from. So you're saying that a lot of these examples were, are, are towns in which the form basic uh, concepts have been implemented? Well, the last couple on signage and, and stormwater were, I, I just wanted to add in, even though they're not, they don't have anything to do with form-based coding. Okay. But the last time I was in this part of the world, I was in Rensselaer County, and it was like 25 years ago. So I don't get you all that often. And in 25 years, I'll be 97, and I'm not sure that you'll want to hear me when I'm 97. <laughs> so I just used the opportunity to throw in a few slides on things that were not form-based codes, but most of it was. At 97, I think you may not feel like being here, but your ideas will persevere. Thank you. I hope they persevere. I hope that they're implemented in uh, the next three to five years. My, my, uh, my question, my point actually, is uh, you, you, um, you, you show these wonderful examples of, of you know, what happens when people follow it, but I think I heard you say that it's a, form, it's a review process, not a form-based call, not an FBC. Right. So I didn't quite appreciate the difference. You could well, a form-based code is ministerial, meaning it's administrative, meaning you've got staff to do it, yeah. which means you've got to train staff and pay staff, and when staff leaves, you've got to retrain them again. There are some downsides to that, besides the fact that the public says, well, why can't I you know, weigh in on what this new Walmart or CBS or you know, car dealership is going to look like? Oh, because you had the opportunity years ago when we passed the form-based code. I think that's, you know, that, 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 that's just not acceptable. So I'm, I'm really not a fan of form-based code for small communities. But for big cities, where they've got big budgets and they can afford to have 200 pages on this one aspect of land use uh, you can, uh, and, and have big staffs, I've got no problems with them using form-based codes. But the, the only form-based code I know of that is at all realistic for smaller towns is the one from Dover, New Hampshire. And Chris Parker is the planner there. He's very enthusiastic about it. And I would not dissuade you from looking into that. Uh, but form-based design standards do just about the same thing. If you take a form-based code like the one from Dover and put it next to your current design standards and say, well, what's missing in our current design standards? And just pick them out. Matter of fact, give me your business card. I'll send you a, a, a short article I wrote about this, which lists the things that ought to go into a good form-based design standard. It, I, all I did is build on what most towns already have and borrow some of the good ideas, like block length or mixed uses uh, that, that come out of the, the form-based code folks. 
There's a form-based code institute in, in this country, and it's located, I think, in, in Michigan. I'm not sure. But Joel Russell was a good friend of mine. He was the executive director for a number of years. But he's, he's based in the New York, Massachusetts area. Thank you. Currently lives in Northampton. And his take after being the executive director of the form-based code institute was that, uh, as is mine, uh, they, they, they're not really open to doing what I call FPC light. FPC light is all the guts of it boil down to 15 or 20 pages. You don't need 200 or 300 pages. You can do it in New Hampshire. Was, you know, it's pretty big. It's like 100 pages just for that. I don't know what the length of your entire zoning is, but maybe it's only 100 pages or 85. And for this one aspect of zoning to consume 100 pages, I think shows you the exuberance and enthusiasm that these people have <laughs> for their particular speciality. speciality. Uh, but they do good work. Uh, but I think we can do good work with, with uh, smaller tools. So, so, so just follow me on that, because I got clarity. I did while you were doing the lecture look up those. You're right, Dover is over 100. But there is a form-based code which I didn't have a chance to look at. So yeah. Is that a subset of the zoning? Is that the way it works in Dover? Couldn't be sure. Um, I, I can't answer that. Let me tell you that a small town on the main coast with fewer than 2,000 people that is losing population, whose main street is two blocks long, spent $150,000 on a form-based code it went over 100 pages. It may or may not be relevant that one of the chief town officials was a high school chum of the person that led that consulting firm. Um, that's something I've heard that in the community and know all of these little below the surface connections. But whether or not there was any kind of you know friendship factor there. If you're a town of 2,000 people and you're not growing, do you need to spend $150,000 on a code? So that really got me, you know, people say, what propels you, you know, to get up at age 72 and do these things? And it's been the same since I've been 42, it's outrage. I'm outraged at all the stuff that's gone on in the past 50 years that could have been done better. But I'm also very heartened by the many good examples of what happened in the last 25 years that we've learned how to do things a lot better and repair some of that sprawl. And yeah, so we're, we're on an upward trend. And uh, who knows, I might be back here on a 97. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Joe Biden's ready to run. <laughs> um, thank you so much for that. And I particularly appreciate the clarification of the form-based design standard versus the code. But um, I'm wondering what you know, given that you started with this reference to your book, I mean, what rural character is in the wake of this kind of standard of design? Because, I mean, within, I mean, the architectural history background I have within that architecture and building has very much a relationship to the character of buildings, which tells you about the lives that are lived in those buildings. And I was really struck that so many of the photographs you showed us, which I understand to highlight the design of the sites that you're showing us, are really unpopulated. And I'm just struggling with, you know, the character of these sites, these buildings, these designs that you're showing us are much more suburban than what I would call rurally in some ways. And I'm struggling a little bit with how ultimately there's still such a kind of car focus when increasingly, of course, what we're challenged with as planners is to decouple you know, city planning from this dependence in, on cars that so much of American city planning does. So I'm just wondering where this kind of design standard you know, offers a slightly different character from one that's still about this, the hegemony of asphalt almost. Well, I think every community through a visioning process needs to sort of define where it is in the continuum between urban and, and rural. And, um, different parts of the town will have, there'll be a different answer because one part will be at a you know, main intersection downtown, another part will be four blocks away, which might be a gateway, and then another one might be another half mile out, which is getting quite rural. Uh, and 
mean, there, there really should be, you know, some design standards that, that, that fit each. But I, th I think that there, you know, when I sh was showing more rural examples, I was not emphasizing closeness to the street or the second story so much as I was emphasizing no front parking and a relationship of the building to the street across some green space. Maybe it has some trees, maybe it's just grass. Uh, but as you move further from the center, you can relax your setback standards, you relax your height standards. And as you get more closer, closer to the center, you will want to go in the opposite direction and have more emphasis on height, more emphasis on closeness to the sidewalk, with the exception of alcoves or courtyards. Uh, so every community has probably a number of different characteristics based upon, and, and that's why you could have form districts, if you want to use the word form, rural form, uh, suburban form, gateway form, downtown form, or you just call them rural gateway, downtown, uh, etc. You don't even have to use the word form. Uh, I think we're talking the same language, whether we're, we're using the word form or not, because we're, we're talking about relations of building height and relationship to the street. Um, landscaping becomes more important in uh, a gateway and a rural area than it does downtown. Not to say that we shouldn't have shade trees and planters downtown, but we don't need, uh, we don't ha handle our stormwater downtown with rain gardens, typically, and we, we don't have uh, large setbacks with grass and benches in a downtown location. Uh, so there's more emphasis on landscaping and greenery, I think, in your gateway and rural than there is downtown. Uh, but it's a different character. Downtown, we're mostly focused on the sh shade trees, both in the parking lots, which have been neglected, I think, uh, in terms of a planting provision, uh, as well as along the streets. I mean, I guess I should clarify that, I mean, I, I fully embrace what you said about the need for density even, you know, I mean, we want our downtowns to be high density to have people walking around them. I, mean, I think somebody was saying earlier, or maybe it was Janet even, that one of the things we struggle with is we want that character of urbanity almost. And yet what people want is the suburban mall culture of I need to be able to take my car with me everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so actually one thing we struggle with with ADA accessibility is that everybody wants access rather than how do we allow for access when it's absolutely needed versus recognizing that walking a block is okay. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I'm just kind of asking, you know, I think if anything, like, we're trying to embrace that quality or, like, an urban quality in our downtowns, and yet we still somehow end up suburban at the most, which is still these strip malls. Well, I think if I could add to that, Miranda, just to maybe illustrate it, I think that a great example of that is the Dollar General in Benning, because he showed a picture a little while ago, that's, you know, a block from the center of downtown, and we focus in that area very much on pedestrian and and and, they, and the building location is is brought up toward the street but if you walk down main street it's a totally different feel because you're looking in the windows the, the you know window shopping is real and in the dollar general they're all fake windows you know so it's like we say we want it to be urban downtown we've got this big parking lot in fake windows you know, so I think that we really need to marry the, you know, the, the concept that we have with the reality of, of, of what's going on. Because your beautiful view, Jim, outside Walmart, like, I think there's three of us in, that, in this room who probably stood in that spot. <laughs> well, if people have a reason to come downtown, they'll come down and walk. You know, they want to go to the library and check out a video or a book, they're going to come to downtown because that's where the library is. Uh, if there are fewer and fewer reasons to come downtown, they're going to just find excuses not to come downtown because they, they want hardware, they go to a True Value out on the Strip, they want groceries, they go to a, a Hannaford's out on the Strip, uh, they want to get a power drill, they go to a Lowe's or a, a Home Depot out on the Strip, they want to get some you know, office equipment, they go to a Staples out on the Strip. There's no reason you couldn't have those more in gateway locations and closer to the street. I showed the staples 
on the gateway to, to uh, Wickford, Rhode Island, and they brought it right up to the edge of the street. So you didn't have to go out onto the highway, which was a half a mile further, and that's where you get to the Home Depot. That Home Depot, what I ended with, wasn't that far from the, uh, from the um, Staples that I showed, geographically. But the Staples was right at the edge of the, the street, and it was before you got to that sort of highway feel of the streetscape. But it was definitely a, a, more of a gateway than a downtown or a suburban strip. Holland, Michigan, you just Google Earth maps, take a look at it, just look down from the sky. You see how they put so much parking behind all the, so many of the shops that people can literally park uh, very close to their shops in their downtown. They're just not parking in the front because that parking is very limited. But there's a lot of parking downtown. They, they spent 30 years scooping it out and uh, inter connecting uh, smaller parking lots and making them larger and better connected. Amherst, Massachusetts did a bit of that too, as well as Northampton, um, and doing some rear parking behind their, 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 their Main Street shops and bringing together previously isolated independent uh, you know, uh, parking areas and amalgamating that. And, and uh, I get the sense that uh, Bennington is you know, doing the same with Putnam Block and becoming uh, the, the parking provider for that. So Bennington is probably going to take over the ownership of that back land, which is going to be used for parking. So there's some good examples of how towns can, with a vision and a, maybe a 30-year plan, uh, create that rear parking, which is continuous. You'll find it in Freeport as well. Um, caveat to that, L.L. Beans was a big part of that. Um, so, at, but as the lady from Manchester said, you know, people have this mindset that if they have to walk two blocks, it's too far in downtown, but they'll walk twice as far uh, in, a, in a mall near Albany or Troy um, and think nothing of it. It's in her mindset, I'm going to the mall, and I, uh, then I can walk and walk and walk because it's a mall, but it's downtown, I need to drive to the front door. Um, and that's where you need to do a better job of providing more convenient parking downtown because we're never going to get rid of that mindset, although we can remind people and superimpose maps of the mall to the, the map of the town center and say, hey, you're willing to walk 1,500 feet out there, but you won't even walk 300 feet over here. Um, there's a contextual component to that, and, and uh, Jane and I had a, a little conversation about um, Dollar General uh, a little earlier in the evening. Um, there there's always seems to be wins and losses uh, when, we, when we take on the specific site development challenges or the challenge of a major redevelopment within a downtown. And, and Bennington is experiencing both of these now, and it experienced it with with Dollar General. Um, yes, we, we want to get out of our cars. Here's, here's one of the positives of Dollar General. They get a lot of foot traffic. Their parking lot is never full. Now, it's filled with a lot of cars that come in. They're there for five or ten minutes and they leave. And that's not great. But there's an established residential neighborhood surrounding our downtown. And Dollar General has responded to a need uh, in a way that doesn't require people to get into their cars uh, to go to what would have, in bygone years, been Fishman's or Woolworths. Uh, and I'm not extolling the, the Dollar General model because it's not ideal in any way. But in this particular instance, it's reassuring to see people walking up the incline uh, to Dollar General, hands empty, and then coming back out and going back to their homes with their shopping bags full. And I, so everything that we undertake relative to development, be it in our downtowns or in our, uh, our, our strip areas, uh, if, if we focus on how can we make them better, and how can we make them a better experience for their customers? In fact, I, I can imagine putting a couple of your slides up side by side and asking a developer or a business person, 
which of those two places do you think your customers would rather go? Right. Mm -hmm. And I think they all choose the one that we like, too. Uh, and and if, if we can, in our day-to-day, -day sell that uh, to people who want to invest and build in our, in our communities, maybe we can turn the tide. And you've mentioned it's a 25-year process. Uh, and maybe we, don't, we all won't achieve the, the goals in our lifetime, but ultimately it will be better. Yeah. Well, the, the town is based upon generation upon generation of people working, investing, dreaming, <coughs> planning, implementing. So we're just another layer in, in that, that whole process. And there'll be many generations to come that will look back and say, well, they had a good idea back in you know, 2018 or 2020. Uh, and they built on it so that in, by 2035, 2040, uh, things are looking better. <coughs> Dover, New Hampshire reinvented itself in a 25-year period. Lowell, Massachusetts did too. Different story, they had a lot of federal and a lot of state investment that Dover did not. So you can do it with, and, and Freeport, they had a lot of private investment, L.L. Bean. But Dover and a lot of communities just did it on their own without the help of a, a major corporate giant or um, state or federal government. Other questions? Uh, I'm anything? Sorry, yes. Yeah, um, going back to your uh, observation about um, people's willingness to uh, walk in a mall versus their unwillingness to walk in a downtown, <clears throat> I think one, one has to keep in mind, at least in this part of the country, that a mall is protected by, from the weather. Mm -hmm. And that, at least here in the Northeast, you know, a good half of the year, we have lousy weather outside. We, we do have challenging weather. Um, the, but there's another school of thought, but I don't know how many people embrace it. There's no such thing as bad weather. It's just, you know, bad clothes. <laughs> <laughs> you suit up. And, you know, my wife and I bike 10 miles a day, 12 months a year in Maine. And people say, how do you do that? You say, well, we dress appropriately. You know, and we don't go where the ice is. And, you know, but most people would not go out on a rainy day or a really cold, nasty day. Um, and older people will avoid you know, sidewalks when they're slippery. But if they're well you know, plowed and salted and sanded, uh, that should be all right. But um, we're, we're never going to get our retail back from the malls, but I think we can reclaim some of it through making our downtowns more more of a destination. Uh, give, talk, give people I, I 10 agree. good reasons to come downtown and they'll come more frequently than if there are only two good reasons to come downtown. Yeah. Well, I would argue, uh, I'm sorry to interject, but I can't help you. I would argue <laughs> that one of the advantages to adopting some of what we've been looking at here is that it makes the downtowns more aesthetically pleasing, which means people are going to be more willing to walk through the downtown. People will park 1,100 feet away from the mall and walk in because they have a purpose and they know that when they get inside they can buy all kinds of stuff. We don't have that option in the downtown. But if the downtown is beautiful and if the, if the storefronts are vibrant, then that's what we can offer. And if we don't adopt some of what we've been talking about in a better, more planned out manner, then we have more storefronts that are not being utilized. And it, the, the downtown experience just isn't as pleasant. The more pleasant we can make the downtown experience, the better off we're going to be in the long run. One of the pictures I did not show, but I probably should have shown, it's hard to know what is in downtown Holland, Michigan. I know that the picture's in the book, but I can email it to you. A person got permission to build a gas fireplace on the public sidewalk. And he said, I will um, build it if the city will just you know, run the gas on the shoulder seasons. It's not to heat it in the middle of winter, and you don't need it in the summer. But what it is, it extends the season, and people flock to it uh, there's a big seating area around it. It's a big, beautiful 
brick chimney, uh, and it radiates heat from the gas, you know, appliance inside it. And the, the, the fellow who owned this building uh, next to it did it to improve his, you know, foot traffic, which it did, but it also improved foot traffic in that entire section of the downtown. It became a magnet and a hangout in a, in a good way where people would come and they sit and they, they talk and then they move on after they've warmed up a bit. Uh, if you haven't been to Holland, Michigan, and you've got a reason to go to Western Michigan, uh, <laughs> Holland should be a good stop. Uh, it's it's not, not near any major tourist destination. It's not even that close to Detroit, which is far from a tourist destination. But it is a lovely place with great beaches and, and uh, I can't say good enough things about it. It's one of my favorite downtowns. And like Bennington, it's got a college. It's a, it's a, a college community. If Bennington can offer natural gas fireplaces on the main street, can I be second in line for natural gas in my house? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to cut uh, off the discussion, but I, I do see it's a little bit after 8 o'clock. And I don't want to keep people too late. So, uh, so I, I want to thank Randall for, for coming for this great presentation. A really very popular.